them asking you your name. Yeah. And uh, they wanted the media guy, uh, media relations guy, wanted them to refer to me as Riddick Moss in right. the article. Isn't that, I feel like that's so weird today, right? Well, I think um, the thing is the majority of the people that uh, know me, not personally, but through WWE, obviously know me as Riddick Moss. Riddy Mo. So I understand that. Uh, I do think it's a little odd. And uh, as I was saying, it was for a Minnesota paper where they're probably going to refer to me as former Minnesota linebacker Mike Rawls, which is the, the, the WWE media guy did say that was okay, you know, refer to him as formerly known as Mike Rawls or whatever. Um, but then the rest of the article, they s- said, please use Riddick. Right. Well, it's just like Riddick Moss is in the WWE universe. Mm-hmm. But, like, that radio show ain't a part of the WWE universe. Mm-hmm. It'd be like uh, like Robert Downey Jr. telling people that he's Tony Stark. Right. Well, I think it, to, to play devil's advocate, it's probably uh, a little bit like uh, they want to... It'd be like Robert Downey Jr. talking about a different movie at a, an Avengers event. You yeah. know what I mean? They want to talk about Riddick Moss in the WWE, in the WWE universe. When it, they want it's promotion. We got to get rid of these fake names, dude. You know what I mean? It's 2020. We got to get rid of fake names. We got to get, you know, Riddy Mo. Riddy Mo's great. Riddick Moss, that's a great name. You know what I mean? But you're Mike Rawless, bro. Yeah. You're Reich, you're Mike Rawless. <laughs> Reich Mollis, you yeah. know what I mean? I got dyslexia. Don't make fun of me, all right, people? And it's like... I'm a real life sweet as hell. Yeah. I'm real life sweet as hell. Yeah. So I don't need a fake name because I got a real name, you know? So it's like, no, we ain't doing fake names no more. 2020 from here on out, we ain't doing fake names no more. We're just doing real names because I'm real as hell and I do real shit and like my real life is sweet. I don't need to make believe nothing and all the fans know who your real name is. They know that you're red, that you're Mike Rawless. Yeah. I, I had a fan because my my Twitter my Twitter handle is Riddick Moss, but on Twitter it says Mike Rawls, right. my, my name. And uh, I, I I had some smart ass tweet about how I think I think I said something like, yeah I I don't because everyone was saying that they don't understand where this push for me is coming from, how I even ended up on Raw, and how I'm doing so well getting these wins and stuff. And I said, yeah, I don't get it either. This Jack, 250-pound, uber-athletic stud, he's doing well. I just don't get it. <laughs> and uh, and uh, this guy responded and said something along the lines of, like, maybe I'd care about you if you didn't, if your name wasn't Mike Rawless on Twitter. Like, I want to be able to invest and believe in the character Riddick Moss. Right. And I was like... I didn't respond because I don't get into that generally unless I'm just feeling frisky one night and I uh-huh. just want to respond to people on Twitter, <laughs> which I think I'm completely done with. You're now. over that? Yeah. But this, I, I just thought, like, you're telling me right now that you know. You know that I'm not actually, my name is not actually Riddick Moss. Yeah. And me me tweeting that tweet is a smart-ass, egotistical tweet. Yeah. That should be enough. That's the whole point. Right. Don't you're, you want me to kind of blend my reality into the character? And that's what I'm doing. It's like, and you're you're going to act like you're getting caught up. Like, you're telling me you know that yeah. my name is actually Mike Rawls, but it's bothering you that I put it on my Twitter. It just doesn't make any sense. It's silly. Yeah. It's very silly. It's Well, it's just like things have changed. Things have evolved, right? Like the cat's out of the bag. It's been out of the bag, but like people fully accept it now that it's Mm -hmm. out of the bag. So it's like, we've got to do something. We got to take the game to the next level and find a way to blend reality with the land of make believe. Mm -hmm. And I think we just, we got to get rid of these fake names, bro. Yeah. Well, I do. I think there's, I heard someone say this a while ago. Um, You got to lean into one way or the other. The either lean into the reality yeah. or, or go the opposite way. And yeah. You see that with a lot of characters today that go the opposite way. Yeah. And, you know, that's 
because everyone knows, like you said, the cat's out of the bag. But that doesn't mean you can't then, then go ahead and go all in on that. So you might take, take it to the, the end of that spectrum. Yeah. Or make the business of the business part of what we see on TV in your character. And I think that's that's something we were trying to do, right, with the outliers. Yeah. Is, is make the whole thing the business of the business, which I think in real life, in real sports, is very interesting. I mean, that's we would always talk about how much coverage Zeke Elliott holding out and being in Mexico during training camp would get. Yeah. Well, players actually not just being athletes, right, not just being good soldiers for the team, but, like, recognizing that they're not – just athletes but they are businessmen right they are a business themselves like right. their their being their body the physical mental spiritual aspect of themselves is a business entity mm -hmm. and you've got to you know you've got to act appropriate you got to act like a businessman mm -hmm. and you that's what you've been seeing lebron has really been i don't want to say he's the first but he's like he was at he kind of changed the game for everybody in terms of start acting like you think lebron did I think he was. I think I mean, he's Michael Jordan's stands out to me. I mean, Muhammad Ali. Yeah, uh, we weren't around for Muhammad Ali, but you know, as far as being some sports entertainment, you know. Yeah, for but, sure. But as far as like, I mean, you always hear the Jordan brand. You want to talk about brand? Like, he had a very specific brand. Yeah. What do you think LeBron did though? I think LeBron has. Uh, he has. He made it okay to put yourself above the team at times, which I know bothers a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But that same team, the second you don't produce in the manner in which they want you to, they get rid of you. Mm -hmm. They're going to run you into the ground. They're going to run you, run you, run you, run you, run you. You get hurt, you know. Mm -hmm. They're going to they're gonna try and heal you back and get you back on the field as soon as possible. And as long as you keep producing, they're going to keep you. But the second you slow down, the second you don't have it anymore, they're throwing you out. And then there's no more team. There's mm -hmm. just, there's me and you, and it's, you need to have a, you know, you need to go find a job somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So while you have the leverage, you got to use that leverage. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think he showcased that with the decision, right? Mm -hmm. And I always just look at that and I'm just like, this guy, he's leveraged his ability, keeping his contract short. Mm -hmm. Asking for, you know, demanding that he's got people around him to make sure that he's in a position of success. Mm. He is always, you know, and then outside, obviously, of basketball itself, he's using all of his, like, ventures to just, you know, I mean, he's worth more outside of basketball than he is inside of basketball. Mm. He just leveraged his ability and his, you know, just swinging a stick around, you know what I mean? Yeah. LeBron doesn't get enough credit for how good of a role model he is especially given that his situation growing up was not ideal. No. I don't know exactly how good or bad it was, but certainly wasn't ideal growing up with a single mother. Yeah, none and of the stats. Being in the spotlight since he was, what, 16? Maybe younger. Yeah, and he's, I mean, never had any sort of serious problems off the court. Yeah. He does a lot of good. I, I don't necessarily agree with everything he does, but I agree with enough and it can recognize enough that, it's only, I feel like it's rarely ever talked about. He's just so polarizing for whatever reason. And I, I've, I've been caught up in it before on both sides of it, really. Right. Um, I don't, why is that? Is it, he's just so good. I guess he was just, uh, I think when you are at, so early. yeah, I think when you're 15, you get called the chosen one mm -hmm. after the era of, you know, Le or of the era of MJ and still during the era of Kobe, mm -hmm. right? Because Kobe was still in his prime. He was probably on the, the back nine of his prime. Yeah. Well, so like he, he kind of had, you know, he, he was in the 24 years. Yeah. But those, he had, he reinvented himself. Oh, you no. Know? I mean, two championships. Yeah. Well, went to two championships, won no, one. No, won two, went to three. Lost to Boston, beat the Magic, beat the Celtics back to back years. Why is that? Why am I blanking on that? I'm, I'm going to take your word for it. Yeah. I'm blank, why am I blanking on that? I don't know. But yeah. The dude, magic was, it was not very memorable. It was right. like 4-1 or something. Right. Yeah. That, well, that was with Dwight, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Kobe and Dwight. 
Coach yeah. stayed dog and Dwight, bro. Yeah. <laughs> he stayed yeah. dog and Dwight. Dude, so that you brought up the, you know, I mean, let's just talk about the elephant in the room right off the bat. You know what I mean? You brought up the outliers, what we were trying to do. Yeah. We were trying to do, well, we didn't try. We did do it. We did do it. We just didn't get the opportunity to showcase it to the world. Because mm-hmm. I'm going to go down, I'm going to say this right now, bro. The greatest faction greatest tag team the ww the wrestling world will never get to see bro yeah never get to yeah. see i thought uh, how does that make you feel well it, one of the most frustrating things in life is unfulfilled potential right uh-huh. and that's just kind of how i feel i felt like as just as an act we had so much potential um individually i think we all brought a lot to the table and then put us together. I think everyone that saw it felt something and we, you know, we weren't always perfect with everything that we did, but there was something about us and the three of us together that was, uh, it was entertaining. And, yeah. um, I thought there was so much potential for, uh, a lot of what isn't in wrestling right now. The, the larger than life, uh, personas, e- egos, yeah, yeah. The personas that, all the stuff that we were just talking about right now. And that is the, the thing is it's so real. <laughs> it, it's what, and, and it does rub people the wrong way. And quite honestly, it rubs me the wrong way at times. Um, I, I, you got rubbed the wrong way by the outliers, bro. The outliers rub me the wrong. No, it, no. When I see, <laughs> when I see a football player, for instance, that's, uh, so I don't mind promoting your own brand. I don't mind the celebrations. That's like, you're just being cranky for, no reason if if that gets under your skin yeah but like the the guys who just they they become too much the antonio browns where it's like it's like he's trying to prove a point of being a distraction or something like that yeah um but that's when you went when you watch the sports talk shows who do they talk about right the guy who's just doing his job quietly no or the guy who's holding out in mexico the guy who's refuses to wear the helmet that they provided for him. I mean, like, (laughs) but that, I mean, that was all the stuff that we wanted to do. We wanted to do our version of that kind of stuff. And, uh, I think any, any time a wrestling show can have, uh, as much variety as it can possibly have, that's a good thing. And I think that's what we, we were trying to look at. What can we do that no one else is doing right now? Yeah. And that was, to me, at least that's, and I I think we we talked about that quite a bit, but that's what I thought, at least one of the things that we really brought to the table that um, not a lot of other people are doing or were doing. Right. Well, I mean, you just look at it. Let's look at it from a physical, from the physical standpoint at first, right? Yeah, that's the other aspect. So let's, you know, let's look at you, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Riddick Moss. Riddy Mo. You know what I mean? What are you, 6'2", six 6'3"? Six yeah, we'll say 6'3". We'll, we'll say 6'3". <laughs> <laughs> NFL so, combine. We'll say, so 6'3", 250, about, you know, maybe 5% body fat. Yep. Whole bunch of muscle just slabbed on. But not just, like, show muscle. Go muscle. Oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, legit. We're gonna. We're not just talking. You know what I mean. This is functional, yeah. high output. You know what I mean. Oh, like yeah. this. This you won the combine, the WWE combine, mm-hmm. two years in a row. Mm-hmm. Very impressive feat. Yeah. Very impressive numbers. That was that was funny uh, because we were both because that was that was the the second or third one. I think the third one that we've done at the PC. Now. Yeah. Um, and you and I were both talking about. Not, out. Yeah, not doing it. <laughs> yeah. And uh for legitimate reasons. Yeah. You know, we both had some injuries. Some, some nagging injuries that yeah. we were trying to to mend and we didn't want to do something that would, you know, jeopardize being able to be in the ring. Yeah, trying to be smart. Mm-hmm. You know? And then and then what we did was we wanted to use that um to uh build our, our characters and so we would we would kinda hold out um because we didn't think it was, it was uh, showcasing us enough or something. I don't remember exactly what. Well, we didn't know that there was going to be a camera crew. Right. Well, then right? We, yeah, then we got, <laughs> we got there on Monday, and I said, hmm, 
all these cameras. Yeah. <laughs> I remember rolling up to the PC mm, and my seeing... back's feeling a little better. <laughs> I remember rolling up to the PC and seeing two semis in the back. Yep. Production trucks everywhere, going into the PC, seeing cameras everywhere. I was like, oh. Right. I was like, we're going to put on a show today. Right. Well, and then, so that was like the, we went in there on the Monday and it, we weren't filming yet. Right. But we saw all that stuff. Yeah. I was like, I might have to give it a try tomorrow. <laughs> and then we got there Tuesday and there was even more. Yeah. And then I was like, all right, I'm just going to do a few events to, you know, be able to get some exposure. And then I just ended up going doing all of them. And then it got to like the rower and I, I had, I had a back issue and uh, I was like, well, I'm just going to do the rower just so I, I place in the event. Yeah. Because if you take a zero, like, that's going to kill your final score, yeah. right? So I was like, I, I just, I, I won't go all hard. I'll just, I'll just do it so I, I, I at least do it. But, of course, then w once I got on the, the, the machine yeah. and my competitive juices start kicking in and the camera gets in my face, right. I just went all out for, yeah. you know, whatever the 500-meter row or 1,000-meter, whatever it was. 1,000. Uh, yeah. And so that, and then it was like, well... Tomorrow I gotta just do everything again. <laughs> I, got, I might as well just win this thing now. Yeah, I had I had tweaked my back like two weeks before deadlifting, and then mm -hmm. we had worked. This is another thing we worked like three three days in a row leading up to the combine, yeah. right? So they had us on the road, mm -hmm. three shows. Then we can't. We had like twelve hours on Sunday off, and mm -hmm. then we come in Monday, Tuesday, mm -hmm. like performing at max output. Mm -hmm. So. I just was like, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to be smart. And there's certain mm -hmm. events like I'm going to. And I, I actually was, I was proud of myself because I was disciplined enough not to do certain ones as much as I wanted to. And it was like, it took everything I had inside of me, especially on the deadlift. Cause I told myself I wasn't going to hit a big deadlift and I worked up and I was like, you know what? I'm going to see how I'm going to work up to 405, see how 405 feels. 405 was feeling good. I worked up to, I think, like, I'd, I don't know what I jumped to. I think I went to, like, 450, maybe, 455, 500, and then I went right to 605. Yeah. And I hit 605, and it felt good, and I was like, dude, I bet you I could do seven. Yeah. And then I was like, no, no, I got to perform. My money's in performing. My money's not in lifting because yeah. that's, that's the big thing here. It's like my money ain't in how much I can lift weights anymore. So I've got to separate my pride. You know what I mean? Oh, I know. I got. Mean. I know. You know what it's I tough. mean? I still go through it to this day. I have to continue to remind myself. And I, um, there, there's people who come to me for advice, or we'll just be lifting together, and I'll just give them yeah. my advice, you know, unasked for. <laughs> but uh, unsolicited. I, I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very smart when it comes to other people about knowing when to back off. Yeah, I'm very reasonable, at least I should say. When it comes to myself, I, I just can't get I can't get past that ego of wanting to work hard, wanting to push myself, and just the wanting to be strong mm -hmm. and wanting to lift the most weight and all that stuff. And it's gotten me in trouble a lot. Uh -huh. And uh, I I learn my lessons incrementally, and then I'll go backwards a little bit. You'll learn, and I'll have to learn the lesson again. Yeah. And uh, you know, I recently I pulled a hamstring. Yeah. And uh, I talked to, so I had gotten a program from uh, my college strength coach, who's now the the head strength coach for the 49ers, yeah. Dustin Perry. Super smart guy and uh, really good guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm real close with him. And uh, so he gave me this program. I started, uh, he, he gave me like this, this high volume program, okay. lifting program. It was nasty. And then randomly, I decided that I was going to start sprinting too, <laughs> but I didn't. I didn't cut back on my lifting um, at all. Right. And after not sprinting at all for a, a couple months, probably, huh. and and even even when we when I have been sprinting, it's been at like you know the PC that what's that a twenty yard strip? So yeah. you're probably only bursting for ten yards, and then you're decelerating yep. for another ten. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm out there hitting flying twenties just all out like, <laughs> and and I, I was okay for a little while, and then I, my body started saying that that's too much. Right. But uh, anyway, Dustin, I was talking to him about it, and he gave me the their their hamstring protocol. Yeah, and he said, and I was kind of down on myself, and he's like, "Hey, man." 
if you don't get hurt every once in a while, you ain't training hard That's enough. true, bro. I was like, hey, <laughs> let's <laughs> write it off as that then. I always say, no matter how, like, especially the uh, elite caliber athletes, even if they're well-versed in strength and conditioning, they need a coach. Not to push them, but to hold back. Yeah. To hold them back, right? And, mm-hmm. like, that was one of the reasons why I've gotten coaches in mm-hmm. the past. Not to program like, not that I need someone to program something for me. I need you to tell me, Dan, that's that's enough for today. Or mm-hmm. you don't, like, I need them to talk to the good angel, right? And be like, yo, dude, listen, pump the brakes a little bit. Mm-hmm. Come back tomorrow, two days, this, that. You know, you squatted the day before. You did this high-intensity something. Uh, just two days ago, you still haven't recovered from it. Just pump the brakes. So that's why you need an athlete. That's why you need a coach as an athlete, especially at when you're the more competitive, that atypical type. Mm-hmm. So we got the, you know, so we got the Ridimo 250, 6'3, mm-hmm. freak athlete. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable, right? You know what I mean? Good looking dude. You got that long, mm-hmm. dark hair. You know what I mean? You got that olive skin complexion, oh, yeah. you know? Greek, yep. You know? Good a looking. A little bit of a Greek god. Can you know. work, you know what I mean? In the ring, can work, That's you know? Say. Very I underestimated know. working ability. Yeah. I think people just lose that because you look the way you do, and most body guys in the history of the WWE are just, they're just not good workers. I think I think the, the people that know uh, what really goes on and and are are uh, observant of who who can do certain things in the ring well and who has instincts. I think those people though. I think a lot of people that think they know that don't really know that like you said they get distracted by there's, the other things and just think that oh he can't work because yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of those. Then, you know, you got mm-hmm. you got your boy here, you big know. Swap. Big Swap. Big Swap. <laughs> oh. One of the best nicknames. Bro. Bro. <laughs> oh, dude, honestly, I don't even cuz it's like There was just a missed opportunity with that, bro, you know. Very yeah. missed opportunity. But then you got me and like, you know, I'm I'm 69. 290 mm. you know and you've never seen too many people as big as me move the way i do no and it's it's a it cut 290 right you know i mean you do i mean the, just objectively very unique impressive look right i mean just there's no two ways around it right right and you know i, I don't want to i'm not one to talk about myself no nope, you know? not at you all yep. i'm not one to put myself nope. over never known you as well <laughs> so i uh but you know i i look the way i do i move the way i do i've got there's something about me that just draws people to me i get on the microphone you know i've been told i could cut a good promo or two you know mm-hmm. so there's that aspect as well so you've got that physical dynamic right mm-hmm. and then let's not forget about old rob mm-hmm. you know we get the third wheel mm. into this 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 dynamic that we have here yep. and just the two just you and i are just a fantastic um just a fantastic squad in itself but when you mm-hmm. add rob you just add a third personality into the mix which just gives you you go from you go from you know addition in terms of you and I being able to play off of each other to adding him and then multiplying exponentially into the different dynamics of a group and mm-hmm. not only things that you can do on the microphone or backstage segments right. or off-site segments but mm-hmm. then also in the ring as well right you've got that third or you know once you're in there with another tag team the sixth component into right. the ring right now you've got so many elements to play with it just gives you a lot to do so it just it really added we had something unique on every card more like we brought something to the tag team division that not a lot of no one else has mm-hmm. or had at the time so then you have that and you know rob's a character dude oh, yeah. you know well i think so it, like you said we could you and i could play off each other right and yeah. i think i think we helped each other do you know just relax and just be ourselves and be get excited and and bring the energy i i think we always had an energy when we were out there and it's the same thing with rob when you add that in it's just another piece of the puzzle that's brings some more different energy yeah but it also allows um 
you and I to not just play off each other where we're just two big bad dudes. We also got this little squirmy agent that, you know, he has a totally different element to the team. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, when you add all three together, like you said, and that was just, I mean, mostly, you know, live event in ring stuff. And we would we would film stuff on our own, too. Well, dude, but, our whole pitch we filmed ourselves. Right. If you remember, you know, when this, <laughs> if you, I mean, if you remember with the way this thing kind of incubated was I came back from hernia surgery, mm -hmm. you and Tino had split mm -hmm. and then you were coming back from Achilles. your Achilles. Yep. You had been back. I was out with my injury. Then I come back. Rob just came back into the building mm -hmm. and, uh, we just kind of looked around, and I know somebody came up to me and was like, hey, uh, you know, Hunter's, <laughs> Hunter's looking to uh, do something with Rob over there, so maybe, you know, you tag with them, and, uh, you know, I don't know what will happen. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> right, basically just giving you the elbow, like, yeah. hey, which he was looking out for me, right, yeah. in that regards. And his gimmick was he was looking for the elite athletes, mm -hmm. and I just saw the people that he was working with, and I just was like, Pfft. Bro, the only two, like, I shouldn't say the only two, but the two most elite it, athletes in the company well, yeah. are you and I. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not any, you know, there it, aren't any other athletes that are better than you and I. It fit, yeah, it fit very well, just beyond the athletic. Yeah. Uh, to me, and it, it was uh, the just the whole look. Um, it, uh, I think we, we filmed that thing and we played it at the PC at, yeah. at, at like, a, a promo class type of, yeah, so we did the competition or something like that. Yeah, they did this. So first, what we did was we all kind of started talking to each other in the PC, right? I had said something to Rob about starting to work, maybe thinking about working with him, and then you came up to me, ironically enough, I, like a day later, saying about working with me, mm -hmm. and I just was like, at that point, I was a solo guy. I had always been a solo guy. And had, you know, the only tag teams I'd ever been in were just a few here and there, mm -hmm. just random tags. But I've always been a, a solo guy. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't really big on the idea of being in a tag team. But I knew you, and we had been in the Performance Center together at that time for like three and a half years, I think, maybe four years or whatever. Right. So something close around that time. And I knew, I knew what you were about in terms of your work ethic you were about your business. I mean, you look the way you do. You got a charisma to you. I was just like, hell, you know, if there's anybody that I'm going to work with, I'll work with this dude, mm -hmm. you know? And so then it was like, okay, let's, I got an idea for this. Let's record this. And at that time, I didn't have the whole setup that I got no. now with cameras. I just had a GoPro. Right. I just had a GoPro. So I had. Uh, That's right. We, it originally. So this is going to blow a lot of people's minds. Yeah. Right. Or or it's going to like make a lot of people like they're going to be like, I, don't know, I know I should have been involved in this. Right. <laughs> but uh, so the original pitch was on the actually my garage, uh, my right. parking garage yeah. before I was living in this building. Oh, really? This was before, because I used to work out in this garage yeah. because the gym, the gym downtown is right, yeah. and I would go run those That's stairs right. after I would train there. That's so right. I knew, I was like, yo, I got this dope spot we can film at. Yeah. I brought somebody with me to film for us, uh -huh. and then Rob met us, you yeah. met me, and then the mystery third almost outlier, yeah. Tino Sabatelli, yeah. you know, my very first guest yeah. on the show as yeah. well. Uh, it's just been revealed. <laughs> it's just been revealed. Yeah. He was, he almost was an outlier. Yeah. But we shot that original video on the rooftop. And mm -hmm. I actually have that video. Yeah. I may release that. Yeah, it was an interesting concept. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... Dude, I watched it, <laughs> and when we did the segment where you and Tino, first of all, the whole scene, the whole setting, feels like a Grand Theft Auto yeah. like cutscene. Mm -hmm. It just felt like Grand Theft Auto, which I could not have been more happy about because right. it's like one of my favorite video games. Mm -hmm. And I've just, I've, I just, I mean, what's cooler than being a Grand Theft Auto character? <laughs> I don't know. There's not too many more things cooler than that. So you meeting. Rid, or meeting Tino on the rooftop, and then you just were screaming. <laughs> I don't. I honestly don't remember exactly what what we filmed because the setting was. It was the first time that you had seen him in person after he left you in your match that which broke your guys' okay. original tag team apart. And he he brought you 
to eventually or something yeah so the scene was he was on top of the rooftop on his maserati we Mm -hmm. pan up boom there's tino on his phone texting Mm -hmm. then you pull up you start walking over you approach tino tino hey you know being all cool tino cool tino i wasn't having hey riddy riddy was not cool riddy (laughs) riddy was angry riddy yeah. What do you want? Tina just yeah. screaming, going at him. I'm not going to give too much of this away, right? Because I'm going to, I'm actually going to post this on my social media. So if you're listening to this, you're going to find this on my social media. I'm going to post, you're going to see the pitch, the very first outlier pitch, what started it all. But then, you know, you guys start going at it. And then all of a sudden, lights flash and uh, a car rolls up. And then you just see two silhouettes walking up and approaching you guys. That's right. And it was me and Rob. You guys are like, uh, I don't, I'm not a, I'm not a good comic book guy, but the, the guy that, um, there's like, I feel like there's a businessman that like rolls around with Bane, the, uh, Batman villain, like, uh, dagger or something like that. Yeah. That's kind of what you guys are like. Like in that, I'll take that, you know, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. as, I, as I'm seeing, he's just this squirmy little suit, uh-huh. and he's like half your size. He is you know little. I mean? He is so little. He'd be like my child. Well, compared to you specifically, I'd, I'd yeah. hold him. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I'd rock him to sleep. Yeah. You know, I'd spank him when he gets out of line. And I thought it was going to come to that a couple. <laughs> times, to be <laughs> Yeah. Dude, the, honestly, some of the be, like, so the people that have had the privilege to watch us perform and, and enjoy the product that we put out there, the, honestly, some of the most entertaining stuff that happened happened in behind the curtain, putting the match together or after the match was together. Rob's anxiety pre match was the best, yeah. dude. It was almost like once I realized who he was and like what once we got because it took us all a little bit to get used to each other. And yeah, like definitely. there was like that process of getting accustomed to each other. Mm-hmm. Uh I just realized just who he was and I just was like, this guy's gold, bro. Yeah. He's just right. one of a kind. It was so fun messing with him out in the ring in the arena (laughs) that was one of my favorite things to do to just try to mess up him up during his promos or uh just make him pop at least you know uh as he was trying to cut a series (laughs) um but you know the the i was gonna say earlier when we we not the not the one on the the rooftop but the restaurant scene yes Um, yes that was the that one was so the the rough draft was the one on the rooftop, and it was it was okay. Y'all will see it. it. It was okay. It was good. People liked it. But that next one we did really really set the tone. Mm-hmm. It it had like a production value to it. It felt like uh, it felt like an HBO series. Well, that's what I, I remember. A lot of people said Entourage. Yeah, and that's that was one of the you know inspirations. inspirations that we had in mind, but we didn't tell anyone that, and people said that without you know without. That's us how we knew it. we were on the right track. Uh huh. And and Rob is a total Ari Gold, and not not exactly, but as far as being an, an agent who's just a total character yeah. himself, and not just not just like the the only money hungry. He's got his own. Sp- kind of squirmy just slimy personality <laughs> and uh he really does too and uh he's just he's got no shame none um he'll plug anything plug anything he'll pl- if you send him free shit he will post it anything. without any shame he does not care yeah. it doesn't even matter if it's good either if it's right. a good product if you just give it to him for free he'll put it up on his stories and yeah. like give you a promo code for it and then the other one that the other one that we got was uh, pain and gain, yes. Which that one's a little more of a stretch, yeah. But I I get that one too. So and then ballers, ballers, too, ballers yeah. as well. We would always get entourage ballers, which entourage was obviously a um, an inspiration. I want to say ballers was an inspiration to an extent, but to be honest, I've only watched maybe three or four episodes of ballers, mm-hmm. which I enjoyed the first. I think, actually, I take that back. I think I watched the first season, and I enjoyed it. But I never watched any of the other seasons after that. I think there was maybe a, a little inspiration from that, just finding ways to add, you know, modern kind of twists in to the pro wrestling world, mm-hmm. right? It was like, yo, let's take 
let's take entourage, let's take ballers, let's take pain and gain, let's take a couple of these different like mainstream entertainment sources and let's figure out how to make it our thing, Mm -hmm. you know, and let's figure out a way like that's the template, but then let's fill in all our flavor. Let's fill in Mm -hmm. all our sauce in that thing. Yeah, definitely. And I, so the biggest thing that I think that we provided more than the physical aspect, which is lacking majorly in the WWE and just pro wrestling in general, not just the WWE. We brought something that was lacking there in terms of just pure physicality. But then we brought an element of entertainment that no one else was bringing. Because with all that badass re-physicality that we could do and all the cool shit we were doing. Because, dude, think of how many moves we had. Move sets, combo moves. We had plays. We named. We had We had everything right. named, yeah. bro. Right. We had number. It was like literally like a football playbook. Right. We had, uh, we had it all set out, right? Mm-hmm. But the entertainment, like we could do... So we could come across as these badass killers when we wanted to, but we could make you laugh in the process. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, we were making people laugh. Mm-hmm. Even if they didn't like us, they hated us, they were laughing. Mm-hmm. They were laughing. They were having a good time at what yeah. we were doing. So it was just like a, a a dynamic that just I don't see right now. Mm-hmm. I don't see it anywhere. And not just in the WWE, in AEW, wherever, all the other places that are out there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's just, they're just not there. Mm-hmm. I, I think there was just so much, uh, we we always talked about just potential f- to do different things that just, like, I mean, we, I'm starting to s- repeat myself here, but just the things that don't have anything to do with the in-ring. Yeah. Um, you know, refusing to wrestle because it's not good for our brand. We had a lot of cool shit S- planned, stuff, dude, yep. for our debut. You know, wanting to sign new contracts, having our own locker rooms as part of our, the contract. Uh-huh. Um, all these things that, you know, have a, a little bit of reality sprinkled in. Yeah. And stuff that you see in sports entertainment and other sports. And uh, bring it and make it just make it a part of the whole package that you see with the outliers. Yeah, I think I think, you know, never say never. <laughs> yeah, maybe someday it will. Maybe be someday cool. it yeah. will happen. Never you know. know? Uh, speaking of debuts, we had a uh, we had a couple different dates told to us in terms of debuts. Right, those all kind of got pulled out from underneath us. Right, mm-hmm. which kind of uh, leads to where you're at right now. Right, mm-hmm. so. We had a couple different times. We had different, like, we had different dates told to us on when the outliers were going to debut. Mm-hmm. And when each of those came, we got a different date, right? Mm-hmm. Then it kind of got to the point where we kind of started realizing the writing on the wall. Well, they, they, we, we did the UK shows, the NXT UK shows. Yeah, that, uh, that was a little almost like that was false hope. Without, was without hope Rob. Yeah. Especially. And, uh, it was an int- interesting deal where it was just like, <laughs> you know, all of a sudden Rob wasn't with us. Um, but, I, you know, for whatever reason, I really look back on that week we spent over there fondly. Like, I really had a good time over there. I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, we went into, we didn't even do anything, but no. we, went in, we went into London. And, in the uh, tube. Yeah, on the, on the in, tube. In the tube. And then we rode home with that guy. Random the random dude. guy who started <laughs> chatting us up on the on the, the train. And then he's he just offers to drive us home. I mean, we were like, I mean, there's a there's a chance we just get like jacked right now and yeah. kidnapped. But yeah, let's let this guy, let's not pay another 50 bucks for an Uber. Yeah. Let's let this guy take us home. I, I, was, I was confident that. If anything <laughs> did happen, we were going to be yeah. able to handle <laughs> there, had, there would have been some serious firepower for us to be in trouble. Right. Uh, uh, I could tell, though, he was one of those guys because he just picked up a conversation with us on totally on the tube and then just started talking to us. And he just was, like, telling us, like, political history, like, mm-hmm. modern, right. sh- everything that was going on yeah, in the yeah, country yeah. at the time, talking about Brexit and everything and all those, all the stuff that was going on in the country at the time. And I could just tell he was like, cause I'm, I was skeptical at first of this guy when he asked for us to ride, to get a ride home with mm-hmm. him. But after like listening to him talk and everything, I just was like, oh, this is just a dude that like has, he's just a handyman that is cause he had a bucket with him. And mm-hmm. I could tell yep. that he did something with some sort of drywall. Yep. And, uh, 
I could just tell, I was like, oh, this is just like a blue collar, everyday totally. working man. He got out of work earlier than he thought, than yep. he normally does. And he wanted to just get home and get a beer. Yep. And he just saw us crazy Americans, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. big ass dudes that just like, yep. like we're like a sore thumb. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. And he just was like, oh, let me give these guys a ride home. Yeah. And gave us a ride home. It was cool. I had a good time on that trip too. Yeah. Even though I didn't, I did lost both lost, my bags. That was terrible. Yeah. And my gear bag and my clothes bag. So like for the first two days in London, I was walking around in a pair of, I, for whatever reason, I had the clothes that I wore on the plane, right? Which was like a pair of jeans, an aeronautical jacket, and a t-shirt. And I had a pair of Doc Martens. Yep. And in my book bag, I had just a pair of workout shorts. Mm -hmm. So I had a pair of workout shorts. I had Doc Martens. Yep. And then you let me borrow a shirt. Yeah. So I was just walking around. Oh, you looked like a maniac, <laughs> dude. You looked like a total maniac. With your boots and short gym shorts on. And you are a maniac. <laughs> and, and you look like a maniac anyway. Uh, so, yeah, that was, that, yeah. I, I squatted in that outfit, bro. Yep. I still got my work in. Yeah. I didn't oh, make yeah. it. I no. didn't make any freaking excuses, no. dude. No. Nope. You know? I'll give you that. Yeah. I went in. I squatted. Mm -hmm. I went and did my thing. I worked out. And some boots that really aren't meant for squatting. Even no. though the Doc Martens, you know, I'm a big fan of them. But they're just not made for work. They're heavy. No. Yeah, they're not. Yeah. They're they not weren't squatting. ideal. Not squatting shoes. They weren't ideal. But it was, you know. And then being able to see different parts of the country. And then even the shows. Like the, the shows, shows were cool. The shows were cool. Mm -hmm. Even though, you know, I mean, they basically just flew us out there. To do the job yeah right that's mm -hmm. why they didn't have rob come right. with us yeah and they yeah. you know even though they hadn't told us they knew that they were going to split us apart mm -hmm. and so they were like oh we'll just put over these uk guys that we're trying to build and we got these two jacked like greek gods over here mm -hmm. they'll they'll make everyone look great right so mm -hmm. it's just like oh you know I'll just go over there i i was like i don't give a shit mm -hmm. as long yeah. as you pay me yeah, I don't care what you want me to just tell me to do something. I'll do it. Just keep paying me. Right. Mm -hmm. That's like the name of the game. I didn't come here to win. Right. I'm doing air quotes for those of you who are listening to this. Right. I'm not, I'm not here to win. I'm here to entertain people. Yeah. You know, and if you like you think this is checking my ego or you're like messing with me or us in whatever way, like that's fine as long as you're continuing to pay me. Right. But so that happens. Right. And this is kind of right before, right around Christmas break. Mm -hmm. At the time, you've got a contract that is windling down. You're about to expire in February, which we've kind of pieced things together that that may have been a reason why this didn't go forward, right? Mm -hmm. um, we get to Christmas break, three weeks off. We come back from Christmas break. Rob gets put in with Chelsea, Mm -hmm. green right he he starts training and he's just in a thing with her you're like mia not showing up right <laughs> <laughs> just you're just expecting to ride out everything right mm -hmm. i should probably be letting you tell us but you're just ready to ride out everything and then i'm just sitting there like are y'all gonna tell me what's going on yeah y'all gonna tell like are you gonna tell me that the outliers are broken up mm -hmm. which they never did no i think i did yeah, yeah, you were the one that told me. Yeah. You were the one that told me. No one ever told me. Mm -hmm. Rob got to sing with Chelsea, and then all of a sudden, I thought you were done. Mm -hmm. Done, done. Everyone thought you were done. You weren't showing up to the PC. <laughs> you weren't having matches on the coconut loops anymore. Yeah. There was no more Riddy Mo, And I was like, man, Riddy's gone. That's crazy. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, February, right when your contract was up, I'm looking, and I see on Raw, Riddy's coming out with Mojo. Yeah, you got to keep them guessing sometimes. 2020 know? has been a crazy it, year. It has been. But I think it's been especially crazy for you. It has been. And, uh, you know, all the way, I mean, I feel like uh, career-wise, it's for a long time. Because uh, dating back to the Tino, and then the literally the morning after uh, we filmed our tag team splitting up, I tore my Achilles. And, uh, so that was like, I was excited to, you know, go do kind of just figure out what my single singles character was going to be a, apart from Tino. Yeah. And then like just completely kibosh that. Um, but then coming back because it was a shoot, uh, how quick I was 
determined to come back from an Achilles and and in such great shape, it kind of sparked this Riddick regimen. I want to I want to talk about your Achilles recovery process, but I don't want to break your flow right now. But we're going to get back to that. Okay. Well, it, basically, it inspired the Riddick regimen character, yeah. and, and along with you know other. Of course, you know, you pull from Tom Brady's, he, he did the Tom versus Time Facebook series. You know, you pull from other things, but uh, my real life basically inspired the Riddick Regimen. And it's something uh, my brothers and I have said, we, we've called the way we live our lives and, and, our, and our training regimen, the Rawless Regimen for a long time. Yeah. And um, that, so then I, I, I implemented that into when I came back into my character and on shows and uh it just i actually i did do one match on tv um and it was kind of like okay good match but no and uh that's that's when i came to you and i was like i was just looking around i was like this dude he's too big too jacked like too unique to not be doing something cool with and then we didn't know what we didn't know right away Obviously, like we said, we went through the the whole process of building to what the outliers eventually became. Right. But we were feeling good about that. I mean, right. that we were we were feeling real good. And like, you know, I think you and I had said, like, you know, we've done stuff that we've liked in the past, but nothing has clicked like this. No. And nothing seemed to click for everyone else that was in on the decision making. Yeah. Like the outliers. Yeah. Did. So that's something I want to. I don't know if we made clear. Um, when we so when we showed the first pitch, everybody loved it, right? Mm -hmm. But they wanted to see more. So then, and they had some, you know, they were like they they had asked to have Tino removed because he was still they didn't know when he was coming back mm -hmm. from injury. So they were like, you know, no Tino. And then they said maybe add a girl or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we were we just started mixing. We were like, okay, we know what they liked from this. So let's go forward to the next kind of video idea. So then we started spitballing some ideas off of each other. I knew, a, you know, this restaurant owner, this dope spot out on iDrive. We had, like, a cool location, cool idea. We had Jimmy, the videographer over in uh, CIL. He came with us, which I love Jimmy. Jimmy's mm -hmm. great. Um, Jimmy came, filmed with us. Um, it was Rob. It was me. It was you. We did our thing, and it was great, dude. It was awesome. It mm -hmm. came out just perfect we showed that to everybody they loved it dude and to what you were saying earlier they we were doing promo classes in the pc where we were starting to put videos out in front of everybody to watch on the big screen which isn't abnormal but they had uh they'd have guest coaches in all the time in the performance center and this they were having promo they brought guest coaches in that were promos were like kind of more their their specialty and they had like four people on the board i think joe bel castro the nxt head writer was one of them on there i think road dog was on there as well i forget i think was it santino was there too that week he, he for one of them i i can't remember exactly which one yeah so we had you know we had some you know some eyes on that thing and like after i remember playing it and people like being like the boys being hyped the boys and the girls being hyped mm -hmm. just and that's how you know as a wrestler when you can get the boys involved like you you are on to something because yeah. we've seen everything yeah. we see 100 100 matches every week mm -hmm. we go to the show we see all our peers we we work three four nights in a row then we come back we watch the film we watch everybody's matches then we have matches during the week watch those matches you watch raw you watch them yeah. we see so much freaking wrestling you just get desensitized to it you see cool shit you know what i mean you're like man whatever you know yeah what I mean? like yeah. what that's it bro that's yeah. it you know you know and sometimes it's just like i know what someone's already gonna do because i've seen them so much yeah and to get the boys to react that way where it's like, oh, shit, this is where they were coming up afterwards and not that fake like, hey, that was good. Like, yo, you guys are on to something here. Yeah. Like, I'm digging this. Mm -hmm. It's just like that's kind of how, I mean, outside of the fans reaction, that was like another red, like big indicator that like we are on to something here. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was fun, too. I mean, I think that that came through. It was natural and i mean just to reiterate what you were saying i think it's just it was different and that's what stood out to the boys i mean not only do you 
go through the schedule that you listed, but a lot of the a lot of the people in the locker room have been watching wrestling their whole, whole lives. lives. Yeah. So to see something that's fresh and different, um, I, it is exciting. I think that that's like when you're when you're in the business and you're in that bubble and you see something that's like different. I, I know like I've never been one to uh, try to give people advice. Yeah. That they don't ask for. Yeah. And and I don't. But like when I see something that stands out that's new and different, I go, oh, that's cool. But like when you just like you said, we're desensitized to the wrestling stuff. Yeah. And so you see it all the time. And it's just, you know, it's just one. Of, it's like anything, you know, it's like chocolate pudding, right? Chocolate pudding. If you're into chocolate pudding, it's great. Right. You love it. Love chocolate pudding. But you eat chocolate pudding every day. It loses its luster. Totally. Right? And that's like the same thing here. Mm-hmm. But, the, uh, you know, the the other thing about the outliers was the plug and play. Like, we could literally plug in with any other tag team and have a great match with them. Mm-hmm. Think about the matches we had on the Coconut Loops or even the road shows mm-hmm. with uh, the Street Profits, but Danny and Oni, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, and I think the, I just named two. There's got to be. <laughs> I'm well, like, well, we who had else? The Forgotten Sons. The Forgotten Sons. Yep. That's right. Who um, else? Well, I mean, we we had a lot of uh, non tag teams too, like where we'd work uh, Riddle and Dream. Yeah, you know. Yeah, uh, and I think the the thing that it was different, especially in NXT, um, where these guys are having these crazy wrestling matches. This was this was not that. Yeah. This was like we've talked about two big bad athletes, two huge personas, and it was super easy. I mean, and we were in there with a lot of talented people too. Oh yeah, for and, sure. And like the the matches we had with the Street Profits, that's four big personalities. Yeah, those matches were fun as super hell. fun, dude. And we, you know, we 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 mess around with it just trying to improve our. Or the match and we'd end up making it too complicated sometimes yeah. most of the time they were very simple matches well that was the thing Brizongo, that, you know yes, same thing dude Brizongo, we had some fantastic matches with Brizongo on like the road the first first image that pops in my head when i think of Brizongo matches are when i sunset flip <laughs> uh, Fandango, and i'm trying to pull him down and you're trying to Pull, ah. pull him down with me. You're trying to, you know, <laughs> wave, wave him through. It's, but that's what sticks out to me. You know what I mean? That's the kind of thing. And that that's, you know, obviously that's a house show deal. Where were we? We were up in Canada. We were on that uh, yeah. Pacific Northwest yeah. tour. Yeah, that was another good tour, man. Portland, Seattle, Vancouver. I love the traveling, man. What was the last, the fourth place? It was It was a small Canadian town. I, slip in my mind. Yeah, I, I yeah. don't. I don't remember. Um, but honestly, those matches with those guys in particular, those guys are all about trying to get the most out of the least, mm-hmm. right? Because they're those grizzled vets, right? You know. Yeah, but, but but they, you know, to their point. Yeah, I think that's that was, absolutely what you should. Those do. were some of our best matches, where the matches where we did the least amount of stuff and mm-hmm. let our character fill in all of the in between stuff, mm-hmm. and. That was something that I ha- I didn't quite understand when I was, you know, less experienced. And I think a lot of wrestlers don't understand what they mean by the in-between stuff, mm-hmm. right? We just think about move to move from spot to spot, but they forget about filling in the spaces in between the moves and the spots with, like, your flavor, yeah. with your sauce of your, of who your, char- the being of your character, yeah. And that was something that when we got to work them, they weren't trying to rush to the next spot. They were yeah. try, they were trying to be in the moment. They were present trying to get the most out of the least. Mm-hmm. You know, like that sunset flip you talked about. Like we I mean, we worked together four nights in a row. Dude, <laughs> dude, the one <laughs> night the longest of all of the nights. So he peaked was it the second night or the third night I he think peaked? I the third night. It was the third night he peaked at 60 seconds, yeah. bro. The spot, the you know, this yeah. dude waving his hands, yeah. you pulling his trunks down, trying to get was, him down. Yeah, he was blown up. Bro, after. I was blown up on the apron <laughs> waving you over. <laughs> uh, well, honestly, it, it is hard work when you put all of your effort into it. But the I think to go along with what you're saying, you can't be thinking. You, like, that's what 
being present means, right? Yeah. Like you're not, your, your mind's not in the way. You're not thinking of what's next. You're totally just all in on the current moment, yeah. which is something that I've, I'm reading a book about right now, actually. Oh. Total, totally huge, different subject change, but it actually applies to, to wrestling. Okay. You know, say just what you're saying, just be present in the moment. And I think, uh, you know, we can say it, you can talk about the in-between stuff, um, but I don't think people really get it. You know what I mean? They it's don't know what the in-between stuff it's, it's is. It's got to click, right? And uh, if you plan out the in-between stuff, it's not gonna that's, work. that defeats the purpose, really. Yeah. Um, but when, like you said, and, and when we're working, uh, and you get to work the same team four nights in a row, for example, and you don't overcomplicate it, and you don't, you might tweak a thing or two here or there, but yeah. it's not not to the point where you're got to remember this crazy spot or something like that. Then you really get to just be yourself, and you're out there with you, and, or you know, I'm yeah. from my perspective, I'm out there with you, and I'm out there with Rob and those two, and I can play off them and off of you and off of Rob, and I don't have to think about what the, the next thing we're going to is. That's when you're totally present. Yeah, and you feel it. You feel it, and it's, it's. I mean, it's, I don't know, something clicks. Yeah. That was so, it's interesting that this particular tour got brought up, because I feel like this particular tour was actually when I kind of had that aha moment, mm -hmm. you know, because I kind of, I was feeling good in a singles role, feeling real good in a singles role, but up until that point, I was like the promo guy. Mm -hmm. up before the outliers i was cutting promos yeah. that was like my they were giving me promos i was cutting promos and then i'd have like a two three minute match mm -hmm. or even less sometimes i would just get so much heat in my promos they just send guys up and roll me up right, right. yeah and which was a great you know <laughs> bro honestly honestly i loved those because like i that's oh, those are great those were honestly i actually like that more than a whole match because like that's kind of the promo part is what i got into wrestling for more than the physical part and so it was, and I was like everyone's favorite opponent, right? At mm -hmm. that, because they knew I was going to get a promo. I was going to get a big heat. They were going to come out and either hit their fin their comeback and their finish or just hit their finish. And then depending on time and like that was going to be the match. Right. But getting into the tag team, I had to adjust to the tag team and then like learn kind of the dynamics of a tag team. Because mm -hmm. for those of you who don't know, they're like tag team wrestling is a whole another animal than single to wrestling yeah there is now you've just doubled the moving parts it's a yeah well yeah you just from a practical technical yes. standpoint it's also just it's a different story it's a Di completely different story different story so there's that whole learning process but in that process of learning which you did a great job for me you did a great job of allowing me to kind of relax and not have to think as much out there and it let me kind of tap in to being present, which I was able to do when I was cutting promos. Cause a lot of times like producers were asking me what my outline was. And I was just like, uh, I don't know. I, I'm kind of going to say this, but I don't know. The crowd might say this. I was just always just winging it out there. Right. Yeah. And so I got comfortable there, but like in terms of actually wrestling, I wasn't quite in the moment. It was still kind of I was there, but I was on the edge of being fully present and being in that tag team and, and you kind of helping me put together matches and being able to talk to you on the apron in matches as well, right? Allowed yeah. me to kind of relax and just kind of feel everything out, out mm -hmm. there. And then working guys like Breezango, right? That, yeah. that allowed it. So that particular weekend, I remember Breeze, Breeze and, and uh, Dango. Dango wouldn't... Uh, they weren't, they weren't really, like, we would talk about everything, but they wouldn't talk about when I would come in for the heat about doing anything. Yeah. So, like, I remember, like, the first night I went out, like, I did, they didn't want to do it. They didn't, they didn't want me to slam them. Right. They didn't want me to pick them up at all, which I get when you're, you're working a new guy or a guy that you don't know that well that's, like, as big as me. It can be scary. Yeah. Right? Because you don't know them. You don't trust them. And, like, you know, those guys also, they don't want to bump if they don't want to. Yeah. So they weren't, like, calling shit or talking. I would kind of defer to them because they were, like, the veterans. Mm -hmm. So I just remember the second night being, like, 
motherfuckers, I'm getting shit <laughs> in. All right, I'm getting shit in. Y'all don't want to call nothing. That's all right. I'm going to call it out there. And I remember getting in there with Dango and just called back suplex. Yeah, boom. Just Vertical suplex. Yeah. Boom. Just hitting them. Boom. Boom. Yeah. Uh, Breeze came in. I was hitting them with the, just body slam, this, yeah. that, whatever. Just was just calling everything out there. And I remember after doing that, it just was like, oh, I could just do whatever. I could call whatever. And it just changed everything for me. Yeah. That was like the weekend where I was just like, man, that's where I really kind of felt myself grow into my my ability as a performer. Mm -hmm. You know, not just a guy on the microphone, not just like a you know this impressive like guy that does moves and things like that, but just really kind of just grew into my entity as a sports entertainer. That weekend in particular was just like that just it just jumped me forward so much. And mm -hmm. then from there, that momentum just, it just built so much. Mm -hmm. And it just, it was a, it was a pivotal moment yeah. for me personally. Mm -hmm. It's hard to even explain, right? You just, it's something you feel. Yeah. And uh, I think that's, it's, it's true in a lot of things in life. I've, one of my biggest problems has been overthinking. Yeah. I've got a, I've got an active mind. I'm very analytical. Um, of myself and of the situation, which is, I think it's good. You know, it's, I'm, I'm aware of how I think and how I react to things. Yeah. And I, and I can see when I make a mistake sometimes and I can often see why I made that mistake. Um, but then eventually you start doing this too much mm -hmm. and you're never just doing things. All you're doing is thinking about doing things. And you start second guessing yourself when you, totally. you, you, you're like, should I, you know, you're like, oh, this would be cool if I did this and this and, and let's see what this is like out there. And then you, you kind of plan something and then a couple minutes goes by and you start thinking about it and you're like, well, I, should I do that? Right. Or what if I did this instead? And then you're like, oh, what if I did this? And then you just start all these different possibilities start happening mm -hmm. and you just, you just flood or overthink a situation and it ends up not turning out how you want it. Honestly, more times than not, if you just trust your gut, you just go with your first instinct and keep shit simple, you're going to kill it. Yeah. You're going to kill it. And that's what we learned in the outliers yep. was we keep everything super simple. We don't have these crazy matches like everyone else's because we know the rest of the card is they're going to have at least three falsies right. before they even get to, you know, mm -hmm. and the fans have started to be conditioned to where the comeback, they don't, they're not with the baby face anymore in the comeback. No. Right. They're it's not, not, it's not the same type because they know that investment. there's right. Cause they know there's going to be at least two or three more comebacks mm -hmm. before the finish even happens. So what we learned was like, okay, all these guys are going to have these crazy matches with a shit ton of sequences, shit ton of spots. Let's keep our super simple, mm. just filling all the in-between with our characters, do impressive shit when it's time, go zero to 60 when it's time to go zero to 60, and hit them out of nowhere with the finish. Mm -hmm. So there would be times where we would like we weren't doing any. There was just it. We would go straight through, mm -hmm. which for those of you who aren't wrestling fans that are listening, that's like not adding anything on the – it's like literally – there's no. Uh, it's like a movie where the first time the 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 main hero character meets the main villain, he defeats him. Right. That, that's it. Great analogy. <laughs> Great analogy. Yeah. There's no. He, there's no. The villain beats him first, and then he has to recover, go train somewhere, and then come back and overcome. No. The hero is already prepared. He just goes straight. He's just boop. I'm, yeah. I was prepared for your little <laughs> right. punk ass. <laughs> but dude, those reactions we would get off of that. Where and you know we did a great job of setting those things up as well in the heat and things like that. We I mean we did our part, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, but just hitting them with something they weren't expecting, just it was like oh my god, you get a you oh get a god. legit reaction out of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. you get that genuine reaction yes, from the crowd, not the conditioned reaction, exactly. Which the audience has been conditioned, mm -hmm. right? Which is you know part of the gig. It's what you do. Yeah. But like when you're, if you're a performer, you know, and you're out there, you want that genuine reaction. Yep. And that's, you know, that's what we were capable and able to do for the majority of our run together. Yeah. On the coconut loop. <laughs> <laughs> Old Fort Pierce. Oh, huh? man. The amount of times. Uh -huh. I'm, oof. To be fair, though, I, I, I had fun. Like, listen, they're not great. 
they're not great venues or you know the crowds aren't in the thousands like road shows or other places right mm-hmm. but as much as some of that sucked to do to travel and set up rings and do i had a great time performing oh definitely and it, on definitely. those shows dude it wasn't it wasn't until for me the very end of my nxt run that the setting up and tearing down the rings even got to me. Right. I used to, I mean, it was, you were there with the boys and the girls and we were, we were just, I mean, everyone was pitching in, do a little manual labor to set up the, the ring. There's nothing wrong with that. You go eat some food, you put together a match, you have the match, you know, get done, you hang out, maybe uh, ride home with a couple of guys. Like I, I, I really, if, if you asked me to do it again, no, I wouldn't want to, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, yeah, definitely. You were glad that you did. Do oh, it definitely. I, I look back on the, the, the times I've had on, on the Florida shows in NXT very fondly. Yeah. Uh, I had a great time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so where were we going? We were talking 2020 crazy year for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, outliers breaking up, you splitting, you know, you almost being out of the company, then you then having like a, a major, yeah. you know, major little role run and, uh, or, you know, you had a, that, a yeah. great little thing before the quarantine happened. You had right. this, you know, great momentum going into all that. Right. Yeah. Well, so it, I mean that when I, uh, was told, the that I would have an opportunity to do something on raw, it was on, um, it was probably, probably on a Wednesday cause it was at full sale. Um, but it, when the way I was told, it was like it could be a few months down the road. We don't know. Um, and then I got a call like two days later. Hey, you're you're gonna be there this week. Excuse me, you're gonna be there this week. Um, you're gonna fly out on Sunday. And I was like, okay, cool. Probably just there to talk. You know, talk through things with creative and maybe maybe uh, talent relations as well. And then I got there, and I had a match and a seg on... I had a match on main event and a segment on Raw, which by the time I got back from my match, the segment on Raw had completely changed. Um, So it was like a little bit of baptism by fire, but it was like like that every week. Things were just changing every week, and it was almost the... in, In NXT, where I was there for six years, and I pitched like... 30 characters and by the end of it the people i was pitching to they could i mean they were like this guy's got like this is like a professional pitch (laughs) like this is like silly his this is not how this guy talks like this is too you know professional it's too fine-tuned like does he even mean it like that's how many character pitches i had done where i was trying to explain and like i talk about how i have this uh, problem overthinking i mean i used to overthink in football like it just trying to be a perfectionist and and i just it would it was my biggest problem i think yeah. it would just be a split second slow because i'd be thinking too much and then you know go from that to raw like i didn't tell anyone who riddick moss was they just said go be riddick moss and it was changing minute to minute like I didn't have time to think. Right. And I think it helped me. Yeah. And uh and then I think the second or third week in, um, I won the twenty four seven championship. And uh then a, a couple weeks later got to have like a, a you know, moderate length match with Ricochet and, and Cedric. And those guys are great. Uh make me look like a million bucks. Yeah. Um and uh I mean it was I was having a blast and uh then yeah then covid came covid came and uh everything shut down shut the and, show down um especially for me with my my personal situation with my brother yeah um having cystic fibrosis and and living with him um you've been extra diligent about extra staying diligent. away from people we keeping, have been. you know trying to keep yourself as far away from anything. Cause mm-hmm. it's not that what you're not worried. 
about you getting it, mm -hmm. right? You know what I mean? Because, you know, I mean, I'm sure you don't want to get it, right? Well, I don't want to get anything. Right. But, you know, I, I think, uh, yeah, certainly I don't, I don't want, I don't want, I'm not going to go to a COVID party, <laughs> you know. But you have the immune system, you have the health mm -hmm. to, you know, that if was you not do the, get it. The, yeah. Right. But you were worried about, you know, your brother, because he does have that, he has a compromised immune system. Yeah. So and you and, had to act almost as if you had a compromised immune system to right. protect your brother. Right. And I think the, the thing was, I mean, like, cause you and you and I got into some debates. Yeah. I mean, arguments, I would call them. And I think, uh, the thing that I was just, I mean, that was the thing, right? right. It was so personal to me because it's compromised immune system, compromised respiratory system. And like, there was so much unknown early yeah. and it just came out of nowhere. Right. Like, yeah. My brother and I, because of this, we we were paying attention. Like we were we were not like unnecessarily, but we had like a little bit of food stored up um, before people went crazy and bought as much toilet paper as they could <laughs> for whatever reason. Um, so like we we could see that something might be happening. Yeah that we would need to prepare for. So we were we had like made a decision. Like we we used to have shuls over. Uh, Elias over, you know, a, a few times a week to we'd make a, our, our shake regimen shake yeah. and sit there and heard it's the best the shake, shake out. It's fucking good, man. I've, I've never had it still, dude. I've heard about it for like two years now. It's I still have never had this shit. Pretty much have one every day. Yeah. Um, but it, we like, we had decided before, you know, everything shut down, like, Hey, we're just going to, for now, we're just going to take it easy on this until, you know, we just got to know more. And uh, now I think we, I mean, everyone, I'm not going to pretend to be a medical expert, but yeah, there's, a, there's more information now certainly than there was in March. Yes. You know, so um, one of the real positive things, which was really surprising because cystic fibrosis affects the respiratory system as well, is that's the main thing um, that it affects. Right. So like seemingly not a good mix with COVID. Um, but, and there's very small sample size, but there's around a hundred people around the world that have had it with, that have had COVID with cystic fibrosis Okay, and around 90 of them have not had to go to the hospital, Oh, which is like, it's very surprising because my brother's had to go to the hospital for stuff that's a lot less serious than COVID seems to be. Yeah. And there's a number of reasons why that could be there's there's like some theories about how having cystic fibrosis may almost kind of protect you from covid from the virus yeah because it's almost like you're kind of used to it you've built up some immunity to it okay um either that or it's just you know it's not that serious it's not that serious i mean right. that's that's the other option and it is like i said it's a small sample size yeah um but we, we've just been paying attention just to the point where trying to, because I, honestly, I've been paying too much attention to it, just yeah. trying to figure out, because I just want to know, obviously, I don't want to, you know, shut down. Yeah, no. And I think the 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 weird thing to me is that, um, so like, I, I, like going back to the argument that you and I got into, um, I like, I, I think at this point I'm willing to say that I overreacted like to, to the, to the virus right. well, and to the argument, to be honest, like <laughs> I, for some reason I was taking it kind of personal and I think it's just because of my Your brother. Yeah. yeah. The situation yeah. is just very personal. I don't me. think I real, I, so that was how serious you were taking it. Cause I just looked at it as you just being your kind of, regular smart ass mm -hmm. kind of self at first mm -hmm. and then i remember Which, uh, to be fair i was it's right. not like i was over there cursing you out yeah trying shules yeah. so elias hit me up and and we were talking because him and i are we're both in the camp of of covid being not as serious mm -hmm. as everyone said it was from the jump but he had brought up about your brother which i had forgot about that he had multiple sclerosis no and cystic fibrosis. cystic fibrosis my yep. bad 
not MS. <laughs> Something. <laughs> Something completely different. Yeah. Um, and he brought that up about that's why you were a little sensitive about it. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe I will. Uh, not that I was really going at, not that I, w- I was. No, at, no, not at all. I felt like it was, I honestly didn't ever look at it as a de- like an argument. I looked at it as just like a healthy debate. It was, yeah, part. it was. Um, mm-hmm. But then I was just like, okay, I can understand that. Like to me, that that is something where, you should do your due diligence in totally keeping yourself isolated because I've been saying from the jump, from the jump, the only, the people at risk are the elderly and the people with compromised immune systems. Mm -hmm. Like those are the people that should be wearing masks. Those are the people that should be quarantining themselves, Mm -hmm. not healthy uh middle-aged americans not the youth that like almost seem impervious to the virus itself like those are the people that we should be protecting Mm -hmm. and if we got to wear a mask to protect those people that i'm i'm fine with that right but shutting down the country to me without a without a strategy while we were shut down and not a strategy in terms of an exit plan Mm -hmm. to me was unacceptable and i think that what no matter what happens with this virus, uh, I think that it will. It has shown uh, the incompetency of our leadership in not only in the world, like this country, but the world. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? I think our leadership has failed us. I'll just talk about the country, in our country in particular, the United States of America. I believe that they have failed us on all. I'm not talking about just the head guy. I'm talking about all the way through, mm-hmm. all the way through, all the way down to the local level. Mm-hmm. And I also think that when, when's the election? September 3rd? Uh, November. November 3rd, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So when no, November 4th comes and people start stop talking about COVID and they stop talking about racial issues, when those just automatically just fall off the cliff, I want everybody that was as loud as they are about everything, I want them to be just as loud as about that. Mm -hmm. Because if when that hap if that happens and when it happens, we should be furious. Mm -hmm. We should be irate because that means we just got we just were psychologically tortured for almost an entire year over some political political propaganda, Mm -hmm. right? Because that's what this has turned into. Mm -hmm. We found a way to turn a virus, right? No, no doubt. A force of nature. So, you know, we're trying to stop a virus, which I, it blows my mind that people think that we're going to stop a virus. It's like mm. saying you're going to stop a hurricane. Mm. Like, are you that arrogant that you think as a human being, like you're capable of stopping mother nature? Mm. You know what I mean? Not to say that we shouldn't be taking precautions to mitigate. Right. You know what I mean? Well, but there is a difference though. And I do see people. So I was on board with uh, taking precautions and you know, slowing this so we could get more prepared. Right. That makes sense to me. But I see people now saying stop. Like, like we're going to stop the virus. We're going to stomp it out. Yeah. We're going to, if, if everyone wears, ma- I saw there was a headline, if everyone wears masks, we're going to, in the virus will like disappear in four to eight weeks. It's like, what? Yeah. What is, what is that based on? Right. It, well, that's the, so. That's <laughs> another thing that has has made me furious with this, is the people that are you know pro scary virus, right? Mm. They keep changing what our goal is, right? Well, so that's what I was going to say originally. Is it seems like there's people who so like like I said, like I, I think it's I like can, they don't want this to go away, right? Well, like I can I can look back now and say, I mean, I, I think I. I my logic was sound. Yeah, for sure. But I think, uh, yeah, it was a, a, an overreaction probably with the information we know now. And I don't I don't get why people, it seems like so many people are unwilling to look at it objectively. Mm-hmm. It's like they've taken a position and they're just going to stick to it no matter what any any new information that comes out. And if there is new information that comes out that should change their position... They'll just change the reason behind it. Well, it's cognitive dissonance, right? Mm -hmm. They can't accept 
uh, even if it's factual information, if it goes against their beliefs, like they can't, they right. will fight it and resist it at all costs. Yeah. And yeah. it's just like an ego thing, right? Totally it's ego like thing. my, this is my, this was my, I was, this is what I said. This is what I believe. And even though that there's information out that proves that wrong, I'm going to, I'm going to be a stubborn ass and I'm going to die on this hill because mm -hmm. like I can't accept or admit that I was wrong, which is like, dude, you're human. You know, yeah. like we're all wrong. We've right. all been wrong. Right. We're all going to continue to be wrong at times. Like just ex like just up. Oh, I was, you know, yeah. I, I was just I wanted to be, I was I was fearful, uh, rightfully so, too, because the way the media like yeah, kind sure. of portrayed this as think, this just uh, cultural destroying like virus that was going to come through. Like you were right to be scared. They scared you. And that's, I mean, that's a legitimate thing that can happen. It has happened. It has Re happened. Yeah. Re recently in, in other areas around the world and, you know, a century ago in the U S yeah, like it's a real thing that can happen. So I think people just don't want to feel like they've been duped. Right, and it just goes along with the whole ego thing. They want to feel like they're in control. I think that's part of with the uh, like all these mandates on what we need to do to stop the virus. I think people have this need to like try try to be in control. They want to feel like they're in control. Yeah, and uh, you just some things you just aren't in control. Some things you just have to accept. Yeah, and like this is one of them. Yeah, like, it, it is. It, there's viruses that have been around for as long as there's been humans on this planet and you never can stop it. Yeah. That's not how it works. Well, and that's just kind of how nature works, right? It is. Like totally. we evolve and build immunity. We go X amount of time without having to worry about it. And then that virus is like, Hey, I'm a being as well. You know what I mean? I'm a, I'm a creature. I'm a species, right? I'm going to evolve. Right. And then now I'm going to get more, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to hop in these hosts, right? And I'm going to live off of them. And then we build an immunity to that. And then they go away and then they come back. And it just keeps happening. Like, it's like the ebbs and flow of, it's like Mufasa said, bro. It's the circle life. The circle you know, life. like if people would have just paid attention to Lion King, Mufasa was teaching us, mm -hmm. right? The way this thing works. Great movie. A great movie. Have Did you, you, Did you see the... The live action? Yeah. Live, I, I, why do we call it live action? Like, it's know. not it's CGI. Yeah, it's not real. It's not <laughs> like it's a real line. Did you like it? I did like it. I thought it wasn't as good as the cartoon. No, not as good as the cartoon. But I was I was happy that they stayed pretty true to they the script. Very true to it. They the added script. so they added some vegan propaganda in there. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, I don't remember when that. when Simba first met Timon and Pumbaa, and then he showed him like that they don't eat animals; they eat bugs. Oh, okay, right? Yeah, which it's like we don't care about bugs life, right? We just right. care about like other mammals and stuff. Yeah, which is another topic There's for another time. Right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, but so we don't care about bugs. But right. they were just like talking about this, like they were push. It was almost like a vegan propaganda, little yeah, just little thing subliminal that they put in there yeah, i i see everything yeah. these people think they're gonna get one over on me you're not getting <laughs> <laughs> people see people don't realize i see it all dude i yeah. got this i don't know what it is my periffs you know that's why i was so good at catching blitzers off the edge in football bro yeah you know, i mean you were never get you're never gonna catch one on me you know what i mean because i saw you on my periffs i wasn't a sneak blitzer though no no i just you're, came up and lined up i was coming hey i'm coming yeah <laughs> Hey, dude, I, I think he's faking. No, nope, no, nope, uh, no. Nope. The dude, scouting report says Mike Rollis, anytime oh, he's in the gap, he's coming. Yeah, O-linemen and tight ends especially, they'll straight up give away where they're blocking. Yeah. They're, like just, just in their stance looking right at where they got to go. Uh-huh. Okay, so you're coming this way. <laughs> Jeez. So I would always do the, I would always look straight ahead. So you never knew. Yeah. I would look straight ahead and... If you were straight, if you were head up on me, like I was just looking right at you. Right. But if, if I was going left or I was going right, I was just looking straight ahead. Cause I mean, I know where you are. Mm -hmm. I don't need to like look at you. Going along with my overthinking thing. When I was, when I played offense and from high school and, and before, 
I would like specifically think about not looking only where I was running to. Mm-hmm. So like I'd make sure I'd scan all over the place as to not tip anything. You were a high school phenom, bro. I was good. You were good. You were so you had you were quarterback, right? Well, so um I played quarterback my sophomore year on the sophomore team. Oh, okay. And then uh I was gonna possibly play quarterback my senior year. And we got a kid that transferred in named Anders Lee, who's like one of the best players in the NHL now. Okay. Um, and he he was he was a real good quarterback. Okay. And he, he beat you up. Well, no, I I for whatever reason I did not want to play quarterback. I just like I don't know if it was like I'm I'm just a an old school ball player kind of mentality where I just wanted to hit. Yeah. And uh, be hit. I don't know what yeah. it was. I just. But looking back, like, why didn't I want to be quarterback? I don't know. Quarterback's the, the spot. I don't man. know, dude. And so that is true. Quarterback's the one position where there isn't a like there is a physicality because you're going to get hit at oh, times. eventually. But yeah. you don't get to deliver. No, you not as much. No. And there's just something about there's something so satisfying about just delivering some punishment. On, oh yeah, on a little mofo. You know Definitely. what I mean? You know. Well, I, I mean. I guess you never ran into this, but there wasn't much better to me than getting an old lineman. Okay. Like yeah. Just getting, just getting right under a big, uh-huh. cover, <laughs> right under the chin strap. And just like for, for me, cause they're coming to get you too. Yeah. We're coming like, for it. Like a little running back. Like he's trying to avoid me. So like, I, I can't just like, you know, kamikaze it. Uh, but an old lineman, like, He's coming to get me. I don't have to worry about him avoiding me. Yeah. So then I just got to put all my power right under his chin strap. And when you get a good one, and uh-huh. you don't always. I mean, my freshman year I, when I was playing safety, I got caught a couple times. Because especially at safety, like, I'm not, like, thinking about, you know, taking on blocks and getting yeah. rid of them. So I'd kind of just, like, you know, do, like, something like that to, like, an Iowa guard. <laughs> and then it was just, like, psh- just grabbed by the shirt and put in the ground like oh god yeah well once you get to that next level the the offensive line are able to get to because this is where offensive linemen excel in the next levels college and then the pros is their ability to get to the second level right you know like it's easy to kind of get to the guy you know the d line and the guys in front of you but your ability to climb and catch guys in space whether that's linebackers (laughs) or safeties that really is what separates offensive linemen at the next level. Mm. And, you know, being a young boy, you know, trying to – thought you were going to give a little one-arm right. show yeah. on, a, on a lineman, right? Yeah. You learn the hard way. Yep. I've been uh, – so leverage is everything. Like, people don't realize size definitely matters in football, right? That's why the bigger the better for the, for the most part. Mm. But leverage, if you don't have leverage, yeah. it doesn't matter how big you are, you can get depleted. Oh, yeah. You can get knocked off your feet. Oh. I've been knocked. I've been depleted. You know, yeah. I've been depleted. Anybody that's played football has got has gotten rocked before. I think so yeah. you don't get to play that game and no. get not get rocked. No, I. Uh, this is not how it rolls. Uh, so kickoff return team <laughs> is so brutal, and so like there was there was one time the most dangerous play in all of football. Yeah, the most dangerous play in all of football, oh. hands down. Yeah, I broke my leg on a kickoff, but that's. That's not even the worst of it <laughs> on that play. We had this we had this play um, my freshman year against Bowling Green, this kickoff, where everyone is flying down the field. Like two guys hit the ball carrier, carrier, the ball comes popping out, and like all 11 guys dive on it. It's just like a great effort play, great speed play. It became like the example play for years to come of mm-hmm. like what a good kickoff coverage looks like. On the play, I'm the wedge buster. It's my second college game ever. And I took it on full speed, but full height too. Uh, and I got buried. Big mistake. And so <laughs> for every time we watched it, John Butler, uh, uh, the linebacker coach, he's the same coach who coached Sean Hayes at, uh, at Harvard. He's now in the NFL um, with the Bills. And uh, Sean's supposed to be coming on the show. Okay. Yeah. Good. Ask him about John Butler. Okay. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we'd be watching it. It's like three years later at this point. Every time we watch it, be like, look at this, you know, pointing out the effort, great effort. And then he'd he'd get the clicker and he'd just keep backing it up and just it'd just be me running into the wedge 
and then going down, wedge going down. And I'd be like, my God, damn it, I know he's going to say something. <laughs> Rawls, get your pads down. I'm like, dude, it was three years ago, coach. I know at this point. <laughs> like, God, we don't have to watch this every time. That's the thing about film, man. That's the thing about watching film is, you know. The, you are what you put on film, man. That's there's, true. It's just uh, you can't you can't hide in the film room. I think that's one of the reasons why, I mean, some of it's my personality, but I think that that's one of the reasons why I don't really care what other people think about me or, the, you know, however, the, you know, they see me act and their thought process, like, I've never really been one that's too bothered by other people's thoughts mm -hmm. of my, you know, I, I'm kind of, you know me, I'm just, yeah. I'm going to do what I feel like doing mm -hmm. and I don't really care what people think or whatever. And I think some of that comes from just always being screwed, you know, having your, you just, your heart exposed all the time. Yeah. Right. When you're on the field, when you do great, right. They're putting that over, but when you do bad, they're, they're exposing it and it's getting rewinded. Yep. And then it's getting rewinded and then it's getting rewinded and then it's getting rewinded again. So you watch yourself, you know, be embarrassed five, six times in a row, depending. Totally. And then the coach starts harping on you. Yep. The, and if you're watching it with the team, the head coach is harping on you. Mm -hmm. Your position coach is harping on you. Then everybody's watching it as yep. well. And it's just like, damn. Yep. <laughs> um, I, so I was listening to uh, Jordan Peterson Oh. on uh, Rogan's podcast and he was talking about why America or the world you know why humans are so obsessed with sport and it's because it's like a microcosm of our lives of society you know it's like this organized structure where we agree on rules you know that's the structure of society but we compete against each other and then it's just like you are what you put out there yeah. You know, it's re very result based. There's and, you know, there's in football, especially there's this element of gladiator. Yeah. And uh, but I think honestly, it, I think football is more ancient warfare than it is even gladiator. OK. In yeah, terms that's of it, because when you really when you study, if you study ancient battle tactics, right, which why would you? <laughs> you know what I mean? Unless you're like a historian or whatever. Right. But when you look at it, I mean, you've got the front line, offensive linemen. You've got yeah. flankers, running backs, tight ends, receivers that are moving in motion and, and trying to get different positions. You've got the running back. You've got the quarterback who would be the general. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to call a play and, and position and, and strategy. Because so many people don't realize all the moving parts that come in football. And, and it's honestly, when you watch it, it it's very similar to ancient warfare and how mm -hmm. they would line up in battle battalions and different squads and they would try and maneuver different units to try and outflank and out position. Cause that's really all football is, is trying to outflank, you know, on offense, you want to try and outflank the defense to kind of build a wall for your ball carrier to get yep. into the end zone. Mm -hmm. And the same thing's kind of true in ancient. You want to try and flank the, you know, the enemies opposing battle lines to kind of come in at angles and get them at in different, you know, not advantageous position so you mm -hmm. can come in and kill as many people until you kind of take cut the snake's head off which is usually whatever commander or general's there right or if you're trying you know siege warfare something different but mm -hmm. very similar to that yeah. uh, you know but you're doing it you are doing it there's a gladi gladiator sense to it because you're in a yeah a just coliseum essentially yeah, right with from a just from a, a an emotional and uh yeah, mental perspective not not necessarily from a strategy People, people are talking about uh, these not having fa fans never coming back with COVID and everything. That's silly. Honestly, I couldn't imagine playing football without fans. Without fans. Yeah, it would be weird. It would be, be weird, right? Be scrimmage, yeah. It would be like practice. I hated scrimmages. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know what. I I, I would assume this year it, it will be that way. It just doesn't seem like it's. I mean, I don't know how you feel. It doesn't feel like it's going away anytime soon. I think it's not going to go away until November fourth. Yeah, that's what I honestly believe. Uh, right now, I'm being a good team player. I'm gonna be a good team player. I'm a good. You know, especially here in Florida, everything's mandated. 
that we're wearing masks when we're in public. Yeah. If I'm going into a store and putting my mask yeah. on, I'm not happy about it, but I'm going to do it, right? I'm going to mm. do it. It makes other people feel good. Like I was at the gym today. I had my mask on. I'll put my mask on. I'll wear it. Uh, do I think this is blown out of proportion? Do I think it's bullshit? Of course I do. I, mean, I think I've made that clear, but I'm going to wear my mask. I'm going to be a good team player. I'm going to play my role. But when November 4th comes and I don't hear anything about COVID, you're going to be hearing me. Yeah. I promise you, I'm going to get loud. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get that deep, booming voice going. You know what I mean? And I'm going to just, I'm going to start talking. I'm going to start talking. I'm going to start talking to all these little virtue signal and naysayers that wear that mask like it's their cape, bro. They wear it like they're a superhero. Yeah. Look at me. And listen here, little motherfucker. Okay. <laughs> I know that you don't even have your life in order. Okay. And you're online telling people that. They need to be doing this and they need yeah. to be doing that. So uh, the, you crazy. I had to, um, I, I got, I, I have my social media accounts, but I haven't been on, I, I go on Twitter for information and I actually just re-downloaded Instagram that I go on every once in a while on the, weekends. Oh, you've been off, but I haven't posted anything. I just, um, to be honest, I didn't, I, I just felt like I don't have anything to post right now. I'm just not doing anything. Oh, okay. And then, then I was just on there scrolling through other people complaining and it was just, it's, social media is just very, very negative. And, uh, I find myself disagreeing with people or agreeing with people, but either way it, it, it uh, sparks a, a emotional reaction that I don't like because it, it kind of angers me. Yeah. And I, that's it. Twitter's just an angry fucking place. But it's a great tool for putting content out. It is. And if you use it for that and exclusively for that, yeah, you're definitely doing the right thing. Yeah. And I will start doing that again eventually. I just think I you just got, needed to take a break. You just got to use the tool for what it is. Too many people and try only to... what it is. Right. So many people try to use social media as this like extension of their personality, this extension of, uh, of like almost like their, their, of their self. So totally. they can like it's use so this egotistical. to project and promote who they are. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, you're making this way too personal. It's, it's everything that I'm trying to get away from personally. Yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to lessen my ego and, uh, so I can be more objective and yeah. stop overthinking things and stop stressing about things that I don't need to stress about. And then like, that's exactly what some people do with social media. Like you said, where it's an extension of who they are. It's so egotistical. Like this is me. This is what I identify as all of these different things. Yeah. Well, it's I'm like, why, dude, why do you, ha I, and this was another thing. Why do you have to tell people who you Ego. are. Yeah. You just, you have to be known as that. Yeah. Whatever it is. And I, I've caught myself doing it, um, you know, not, not from a character perspective, but from a real life perspective where, and they're good things that I want to be known as, such as hard worker and tough and stuff like that. But like, I'll just be them. Mm -hmm. uh, no one needs to know that. Yeah. And like you figure you'd know not that I not that I brag about it necessarily, but it, it is something that like I wanted have wanted to be known as and I, wanting to be known as it is, in my opinion, detrimental to actually being it. You just just be just be what you're about. Yeah. And let let whatever you're you are define it yourself. You don't need to define yourself for it. Take action. That's what you got to do. Take action. You, less thinking more doing yes for sure that you know i saw this crazy stat about twitter that twitter is i think it was two percent of the population right it's not it's not the general sentiment really no is that what you're getting yes at? it's yeah. only, like it's only the people on twitter the opinions it's, it's that totally you see true. is is and Two percent of the population. Yeah. Right. So you're letting this very, very small group of people kind of dictate mm -hmm. and like the kind of the ebbs and flows of society. Or if you're on there, you think that that is. Yep. 
I catch myself doing that sometimes. You think that that's how society is going. People are like, oh, man, this, the world we're in today. Like, where are we going? It's right. just, But it's like, dude, there's so many people in this, even in this country, that don't ever go on Twitter. Right. That don't put their opinion out there. That don't give a shit about social media. That yeah. have completely different thought processes than the majority. Right. And you just have these two groups of people on social media just going at each other, mm -hmm. essentially. My side versus your side. Yep. My team, your exactly. team. This and that. And just like creating this this negative you know, this very negative, almost for themselves, creating, you know, it's this pseudo culture, right? That's yeah. on there. And then it's like affecting them in real life. Mm -hmm. But it's like, dude, nobody really gives a shit. And to be honest, totally. the person you're probably arguing with is some 15 year old trolling you. Right. Well, that, yeah, I mean, some of it that they're not even real accounts. They're bots. Real people. Yeah, they're bots. Well, it's like I saw a stat. 40 it was like 40 percent of the accounts on twitter talking about covid were chinese bots right i saw something like that too which is something that people know so this is you know we're back on covid but and you know it's all that's kind of going on right now Co so people are extremely naive if they think china doesn't want dissension within our country mm -hmm. and i mean let's just say it right this this virus was was from a lab in Wuhan. Mm -hmm. We know that. They didn't, uh, the World Health Organization did not release. They knew the information in uh, December. Some believe even November. But we know in December they were aware of it and didn't make America or the rest of the world aware of it until February, which is part of the reason why we've broken off for, from who and then you see China, like China just has so much to gain from, cause like you're not taking down America from the outside. You're not doing it with any political might or uh, military might. You're doing it from us tearing each other apart. Mm -hmm. And right now that seems to be going according to plan. Yeah. And it's not a unique tactic just to like China, you know, I know someone's listening to us right now. America does that too. Yes, I know America does that too. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of other countries do that too, but Y'all in America are falling for it right now. Right. You're getting duped and brainwashed and propagandized. And I just made that word up <laughs> by some Chinese bots, you know, some Russian bots, whatever bots that are out there that are trying to create dissension. Yeah. And it's just like people think clearly. Yeah. Get out of whatever is going. I just think that between everybody kind of being locked down and I don't know I think it's like people don't have real struggle anymore they don't have I think there's this lack of almost purpose in people's lives mm -hmm. where you need to have some struggle yeah you need yeah. to have something you need to have something to overcome nobody has and if there's not that they'll you find I it. agree totally you I look for it in creative. other places you just create it and you mm -hmm. you do it just destructively mm -hmm. everyone does it not I shouldn't say everyone I know I do it to on smaller scales for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's definitely something that is natural for humans to do. It's part of the ego. You know, you want to, you want something to overcome. You, you want this like suffering, you know? Well, life is suffering, right? Right. That's what all the religious scholars say. That's mm -hmm. what a lot of philosophers say, right? Life is suffering. And there's like two ways that you can like look at things, right? You can look at life in terms of, if, well, if everything's suffering, then nothing it means anything. There's mm -hmm. no meaning to life. Or you look at it the other way. Everything is meaningful. Everything you do is meaningful. Mm -hmm. And then the pros and cons of that is if nothing means anything, then you don't have to worry about anything. It's right. relatively stress-free. You have no responsibilities, but you are going to deal with you're going to increase that suffering exponentially. Mm -hmm. But if you make the choice where everything means something, everything you do matters, then you're going to reduce suffering. Mm -hmm. And not only for yourself, but for those around you, mm -hmm. which I don't know is you could look at is maybe like the most noble of paths to take in this world. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's one of the things since, it happened before my car accident. 
I kind of started drifting in this direction where I kind of been feeling like I'm, I was missing a part of myself in terms of, I was so me, me, me focused all the time with football, then going right into wrestling. Like I was just worrying about all these things, just about me to get to this goal, this destination I was trying to go to and, and justifiably. So it's, you got to be selfish and you got to kind of have blinders on to achieve anything great, especially in like our fields. And you, you're fully aware of the sacrifice that needs to come mm-hmm. with that. Um, but I felt I'm at a point in my life where I feel so comfortable and confident in my abilities to obtain these things, these dreams and goals that I have that I can also pull others along with me. Mm -hmm. And I've always kind of been pulled to wanting to help others. You know, I thought I wanted to be a teacher for the longest time growing up and being a coach. You know, when I got to play football, I thought about getting into coaching as well. I I like to help. I want to help. I want to, I want to lead by example. I want to, I want to drop knowledge on, on some people on some, on the youth or anybody that's looking for something. If there's anything I can do to help somebody, I want to do it. And I want, you know, it's like you said, less talk, more walk, right? Take mm-hmm. action and show I'm going to lead by example. I want to help and I want to pull people up. So like, that's kind of, I was feeling that leading up to the accident. And then when the accident happened afterwards, I just, kind of had this epiphany this aha you know come into jesus moment if you want to call it where it's just like i need to do more while i'm here on this plane of existence i need to do more to increase the well-being of other people's lives around me Mm -hmm. i need to add more value i need to be a multiplier Mm -hmm. in terms of beyond sports entertainment beyond athletics beyond entertainment just everyday life Mm mm-hmm I think so for me, um, COVID has just given me a lot of time to self-reflect and come to a lot of the same conclusions. And I think one thing along with that is being singularly focused on this. Well, first of all, singularly focused, I do think is detrimental to you as a, as a human. Yep. And, um, but it is, it's good to be focused and have work ethic towards, better in your situation but if you think there's like some magic destination where you think oh i can now i once i get to that point Mm -hmm. then i'll start helping other people then i'll start enjoying myself that's never going to come if that's how you think about it you have to enjoy what you're doing now you have to start helping people now because i mean like it's all relative anyway you know when i was fresh out of college, no NFL job, um, you know, making shakes for the University of Minnesota football team. And then I look to where I am now, I'd go, well, yeah, as soon as I get there, I'll start doing this stuff. I'll enjoy myself when I'm on Raw, Raw Superstar. Or now I can look at it and say, you know, oh, once I become this or once I secure this amount of money, then I can start relaxing. And that's when I can start looking to help other people. But you got to do it, you know, you got to do it now. What are you waiting for? Yeah. All you have is now. That's the that's the book I'm reading. It's all about now. What is it? It's called The Power of Now. Power of Now, okay. Mm-hmm. Is that Eckhart Tolle? Yes. Writes? Okay, so mm-hmm. I have seen that book. Mm-hmm. I've been seeing a bunch of people putting that, uh, posting that book or talking about how well that book is, how good of a read it is. It's very interesting. Okay. Um, especially for me, it's tough because uh, I think I do, I think I'm, I'm okay at a lot of the stuff and I'm already messing up the whole point of the book by saying I'm okay at doing the stuff because that doesn't even make sense. The whole point <laughs> is you, you just are. Yeah. You just, all you have is the present moment and you just are. You don't judge yourself for not being in the present moment. You just recognize that you're not and yeah. you recenter yourself. Um, but I think with my overactive thinking, it's hard for me to turn my brain off sometimes. Yeah. And like, I don't know. I don't know if, uh, if this is exactly why, but like, I've been, I can, I can fall asleep very easily. But, like, lately, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and 
go to the bathroom or something, come back, it's like 50-50 if I get back to sleep. It'll be like, like today I woke up at 3 a.m. and I've been up since 3 a.m. Okay. And I've been going to bed at like, I mean, I don't know what time it is right now. It's way past my usual <laughs> bedtime. Um, but I, I think a part of it might just be my mind. I have a hard time. Um, well, so what's your, so what is your going to bed process? Cause this is something with the quarantine, right. Is kind of threw everyone's life into like, uh, you know, just turn it upside down and everybody kind of has a schedule. I ha- kind of had a schedule, but I had to create a new schedule for myself and, right. and I'm trying to be more diligent with my bedtime. Mm-hmm. I've been trying the same thing. I've been trying to wake up earlier because with, you know, with wrestling and that schedule, a lot of times you're up late. Right. And so you're getting home late and you're either not getting a lot of sleep or the sleep you're getting is just like you're waking up at 11 or 12 to get a full night's sleep. Mm-hmm. I've been trying to change my schedule now that I don't have all those obligations to trying to normalize it. And one of the things that I've been finding is absolutely essential to establishing a new bedtime is one waking up, setting a wake up time is the most important thing. So first set a wake up time, wake up at that time regardless. But two is my, I have a morning routine to start my day and I've always had I've been very diligent about having a morning routine. Mm -hmm. I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this. Then I start my day. I didn't have a going to bed routine. Mm -hmm. I didn't have at this time, I'm shutting down all my electronics. This time I'm getting into my bed or at this time I'm drinking this, taking my supplements. Then I'm getting into my bed, turning off electronics. Maybe I'll read before laying in bed. And then at this time, because say I want to go to bed at 12, I don't just go lay down at 12. Right. I get in, you know, I start shutting things down leading up to 11. Then at 11, I start my little routine. I, you know, I'll take my fish oil. I'll take my resveratrol. uh, I'll drink a glass of water. I go into my room. I'll start reading a book. And then hopefully by the time, and then I'll play my 963 hertz little thing that I play. And then by 12, I'm out. Mm -hmm. And I've been finding that that has been super beneficial because it's almost like, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll think about my day during that hour as well. What were the things that I wanted to achieve during that day? Did I achieve them? Did I not? Did I learn anything? It's almost like I'm unpacking the day. I'm thinking about the day. It's almost like a, a meditation to go to bed. Mm -hmm. Like I'm meditating. I'm thinking upon the day. I'll may throw in a little, whatever affirmations that I want to kind of set up my next day. And then I go to sleep and it's been just super beneficial for me. Good. Yeah. Um, that's, I was going to ask you if there's anything that you've been working on during this time. Cause right. There's yeah. like, there's nothing to do. You got to just do something. It sounds like you've been pretty productive with that. Yeah. Um, I've been doing, I mean, shit, I started this podcast, right? I started, you know, I kind of started my own little business. I've been trying to get, you know, I'm trying to get into acting right in the mm-hmm. Hollywood, but everything's kind of shut down right now and yeah. works with a couple casting agents and stuff. But that's been one of the things that I've been working on is like getting more regimented mm-hmm. in a, because it was so freestyle with wrestling because you just never know the schedule. It has yeah. to be because mm-hmm. things change so much. And it's fine when you're in that world because it's like you always have action and mm-hmm. you're always working towards something and you know, like, I don't know what the day's going to bring, but the day's going to bring something, right? Mm-hmm. I'm going to get this email. I'm going to get this or that and I'll, I'll know what to do. But now it's like, I don't have that and I'm just left with this chaotic schedule. Right. So it's like, I've got to create a new schedule and it was much harder than I thought it was. Mm-hmm. I was like, dude, I'm like, you know, I'm so like mentally tough and disciplined and resolved with almost everything I do, you know, like I, I, I went months in a caloric deficit, you know, like I could, I've gone years of never missing training, you know, Mm -hmm. I, I read this and I do that and I eat and I do all these things. And I'm, I, anybody that knows me would probably use discipline as uh, an adjective for me. But when it was, you know, coming to set in this bedtime in this wake up time, it was one of the hardest things I've done in quite some time. Mm -hmm. And until I kind of worked on finding this going to bed routine that I had, 
waking up schedule, setting these times. And like you were saying, not being so hard on yourself. Mm. That is another thing that I, I think the accident more than anything kind of brought that on to me was just like, I kind of came to the epiphany that I'm way too hard on myself. Mm -hmm. I do not love myself enough. Yeah. I'm way too harsh. I'm the way too big of a critic Mm -hmm. and which is, it's a double edged sword because it has got me to where I'm at, but Mm -hmm. it's also caused a lot of negative emotion. Yeah. And I found myself after the accident kind of sitting in those emotions and those feelings and recognizing when I was being hard and getting emotional over it, you know, and being like, why am I so hard on myself? Yeah. You know, like, I don't, dude, look at everything that you've achieved, Mm -hmm. you know, like you should be proud of what you've achieved. You should be a proud of how you handle yourself, the man that you've become socially, professionally, like don't there's no need to be that hard on yourself like yeah hold hold yourself accountable exactly be disciplined Mm -hmm. do the things that you're supposed to do to make sure that you have a better day tomorrow than you did the day right you know the day of but you don't need to kill yourself no yeah that's the whole thing is you don't have to do that you just uh recognize if there's something that you need to change and then change it yeah you don't need to beat yourself up over it but that's i think uh because I, you know, I went through the same thing with no schedule, and uh, you know, it was fine for a minute. Like it was kind of nice to yeah. to just wake up and like I just watched TV as I ate breakfast and like slowly drank a pot of coffee, and <laughs> then like worked out and ate. And then, but after a while, I was like, I need to do something here. That mind, that that gerbil in the mind, bro, and uh, start spinning that wheel. So some of it's just been like, a, dude, I honestly don't know if I've ever read a book before quarantine, like legitimately cover to cover read a book. Okay. And now I've read two. Oh shit. And so the one, the one is the Eckhart Tolle one. Uh huh. And, uh, the other one is, I told you that I've been doing some trading and uh, specifically trading stock options. Oh, stock broker Riddy Mo exactly. up in this motherfucker. Yeah, I'm saying, <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying you got it. Wolf of Wall Street ain't got shit on my no, boy. No. Um, yeah, so then I, I, I read a book uh, about trading options. And uh, that's what, I mean, now I've got a totally different routine where I'm waking up and... Uh, early as hell and 3 a.m is not ideal i don't want to wake up at 3 a.m that's too <laughs> too early but i'm waking up early and i'm getting my workout in and my breakfast in before the market's open oh. and i'm pretty pretty uh locked in for most of the tra- uh, trading day okay and then um you know afterwards i shut it down yeah and uh it's been uh it's challenging and which I enjoy and uh, at times rewarding. And it's just, it's like a, a skill, you know, I feel like I've used this time wisely and, and, and productively. Um, and as, as well as not, you know, not just productively in a uh, very material sense, but, you know, like I said, looking at myself and, yeah. um, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot more, interested in a lot of the stuff that like i've never been uh i've kind of just been like if it doesn't affect me i just don't care yeah and uh i've become a lot more open to what's going on in society what's going on in the world and just paying attention to it and why that's like I, I, I listen to psychologists talk about it and stuff like that not so much from the political perspective but psychologically and obviously politics yeah are intertwined with that but um so i feel like uh you know as much as this whole experience has been terrible for like truly terrible for some people and you know not ideal for me and a lot of other people um i feel like i've used it to my benefit it sounds like you have to. Yeah, I um, I think some of that comes with just maturity. 
I do. As a man, Mm -hmm. as a woman, right? You, you kind of get older and you get away from that and not so much older because you can get older and not get more mature. But as you get more mature, you start realizing that life isn't just about you. Mm -hmm. Right. And even though it, all that you can control is you, right. For the most part, we're all so interconnected beyond our comprehension. Mm -hmm. And when you start seeing that and realizing that that's where that mindfulness kind of comes in and you start being more mindful of the people around you and like their emotions and feelings and you can sense things more and it kind of lets you kind of judge a room on how to like behave or when you interact with somebody you can maybe kind of sense where they're at and be more empathetic in a conversation based on just these little nuances that you're now opened up to Mm -hmm. for me during this time i've really uh I I feel like I've put in, I've been, I feel like this time is like, it's almost like time doesn't exist right now. It's like, I I don't know if you're a Dragon Ball Z fan, but like the hyperbaric chamber, you like go in there for a day and it's really, you were in there for a year, but when you come out only a day has passed, I feel like that's like what has Mm -hmm. happened here. Yeah. And, uh, it, it's been, it's been hard because I got my good days and I got my bad days. Mm Hmm. And the bad days can be rough. And earlier in the quarantine, the bad days sucked. And I don't know if that was just waves of the concussion. Because some of that Could was be. just like, I I was going through a lot in the during the quarantine. More than just being locked down. It was like lockdown, near death experience, released from my job. Like everything that I had and was mm-hmm. doing was just turned upside down. Yeah. And I was dealing with like a major head trauma and some injuries and like my car being mangled and trying to just a lot of shit. Right. Mm-hmm. So I was trying to figure out what was really bothering me. You know, was it like my emotions and my feelings? Was it this quarantine not having my job? How much of the concussion was affecting me because I am. I have such a high pain threshold. I can kind of kind of just push through stuff at times, but that doesn't mean there isn't something underneath the surface that I could be kind of neglecting or ignoring that's still affecting me. And as the more people I talked to during this, everybody was kind of saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I got my good days and my bad days. Mm -hmm. I got my good days and my bad days. People that are successful, very successful people telling me the same thing Mm -hmm. and i just kind of came to the to the point where i was just like this is hard for everybody Mm -hmm. we're all going through this shit right now and like there's some some days you are having a it's it's not going to be a good day right Mm -hmm. some some days are going to be harder than others but when you start that overthinking happens that little hamster starts rolling on the wheel Mm -hmm. you turn a bad day into a terrible day yep and that's where it's just like hey I can't control anything that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. I can't get a job right now. Nobody's hiring, right, for your field. Um, I I can't go out without a mask, or I'm kind of stuck in the apartment today, or there's really nothing to do. I can't go to work. I can't do that, right? I can't control those things. That's okay. It kind of sucks. Just don't You get that negative thought in your head. Don't keep feeding it. Yeah. Because it's going to just be in a circle. It's going to be an ever-repeating loop. Just when you feel that happening, throw in a positive thought. Just Mm -hmm. throw a positive thought in there. Mm -hmm. Talk to yourself positively, and that wheel will stop. You'll break the cycle. I think even just recognizing that it's there is is a great start. And and when you recognize that it's there, don't beat yourself up for it, right? It's it's okay to... Just recognize it. It's there. Mm -hmm. It's a negative thought. It's okay to have negative thoughts. Yeah. It's not okay to keep perpetuating the negative thought. Once you recognize it, just throw something positive in. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a lot of the work, you know. I like I said, I've been I've been trying to work on being more uh, more. I've been trying to explore all of my emotions. You know, I've been finding there's been some stuff. It's weird because it's certain things that I thought I had dealt with in the past coming back 
mm-hmm. in a different form and having to deal with them again. It's almost like, like you said earlier, talking about training and getting hurt and getting smart about not getting hurt while you're training and then doing something to set yourself back and having to learn the lesson again. Right. I, I, I think that there's lessons in our life that we have to learn multiple times Mm -hmm. from different books, different sources, essentially. Right. And I think that that's kind of, I've been exploring even more of my emotions and digging deeper into my emotions and, and finding things that upset me and just not holding them in, letting them, letting them out. And even, and if that means crying, just crying. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm one of those guys, like, I'm going to try not to cry, but I've been, not if i feel that urge coming i just let it go Mm. you know i just let it happen because i need to let it out yeah and it's just it's there and it's a feeling and it's like man that was in there for a long time but i feel a lot better now that that's out yeah um i'm reading an interesting book right now it's called uh king warrior magician lover archetype or uh archetype of the masculine uh psyche and basically they go in and talk about the male psyche and all the different archetypes from a psychological standpoint these guys are like Jungian uh disciples i believe the two psychologists that wrote this book they talk about the spectrum which imagine a pyramid Mm -hmm. and all four sides are a different archetype and that the top is its fullest, that archetype's fullest expression. Then at the bottom are like the negative poles mm-hmm. of that archetype. That's like the negative side of the archetype. Every archetype has an unevolved negative aspect to it. And your job is to kind of get to the full expression of it. Mm-hmm. And there's the immature masculine, which when you're a youth you have, and they have each archetype for that. And then those archetypes, when you become a man, right, evolve into the king, the warrior, magician, lover. And it's a great book. I think it, it, I recommend anyone to, especially men, but women too, it'll help you as well. Go out there, read the book. But essentially one of the things they talk about is how in today's society with all this confused, like men being attacked and not feeling like they have a place to go or always being, you know, like the talk, toxic masculinity thing as well. Men kind of struggling more than ever. And one of the things they talk about is there's no initiations anymore. There, are, if for, Since the beginning of human civilization, every culture has had initiations, in particular in, boy, in, in the, the male hierarchies right there's an elder a wise elder usually of the magician archetype that leads the youth through an initiation and he's wise older uh respected man in the culture that will lead a youth through this initiation process safely and out the other side as a fully evolved you know man in his full expression and we are lacking that in our society. So what we're getting is all these, the immature masculine is just sticking around. There's no this, there's no f- growth. There's no this fully masculine expression anymore in our society, which was rare even during these times where there was initiation because it's hard to kind of get to that. It's not easy to become like a fully evolved, expressed man, right? Mm-hmm. So the lack of that, that's where they talk about toxic masculinity. It's not masculinity that's toxic. It's the immature masculinity that is toxic. Right. And it's been rewarded as well. You know, it's 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 what you see on TV. It's what propaganda tells you what a man is, right? Mm-hmm. You see on TV, like, all the, the negative, like, a man doesn't cry. He's only happy or angry. He gets all these chicks and he's just banging all these girls and he makes a bunch of money and he drives fast sports cars, you know, you know, the the shtick. And it's like, no, that's, that's, that's immature. That's the unevolved masculine, right? Right. That's not masculinity. There is no masculinity itself is not toxic, right? It's the unevolved version that is. And the, the book's great. They go into great detail about things and the importance of everything. It's a great read. I've already read through it once, and I'm reading through it a second time. Oh, That's wow. how good it is. Yeah. And it was an easy read, too. So I loved it. 
That's the book I'm on right now. Yeah, sounds cool. I would not, uh, anyone listening to this, when we started with the outlier talk about two big bad dudes, <laughs> I, wonder if, I wonder if they thought we were going to get here to all of our spiritual and emotional <laughs> awakenings during COVID. I think we can't, we, we uh, came a long way. From we that. did. We did. We came in with a lot of bravado, a lot we of did. ego, and then yeah. we, we, we came in. We evolved. We into did the, throughout, the, we, throughout the podcast. <laughs> we evolved into our full expression as yeah. masculine men. But now we're going to go out into the community and lead young men into their fullest expression. I don't know. I think if I'm that, ready. Well, I am ready. And I'll help lead you into. Okay. I'll follow you. Know, and I'll I'll help you know anybody and everyone that I can in the process. Yeah. Um. Anything else you want to get in before we get up out of here? Oh man. I mean, we've had a great talk. We have had talked a great about talk. a bunch of shit. Talked about a lot. I think a lot of wrestling fans are going to be happy that you were on here. I've been getting blown up. When's Rady getting yeah. on the show? Yeah. I just keep adding you. I at you. I with saw this like dude. one of them, but like I said, I I, I got rid of my social yeah. media for the most part. I like uh, I had a bunch of uh, messages from you on Instagram because you're always sending me like the nature <laughs> videos and stuff. I had like 15 <laughs> backed up because I hadn't checked for so long. Just animals doing yeah. animal shit. I love that though. Me too. The there's something about uh, with all that we're talking about, and you're you know, you're saying the interaction with others, it's not just about yourself. There's something about animals too that in the interaction with them and nature that it's not just like a mental fascination, there's something else to it. Oh, yeah, it's primal, dude. There's, you know what I mean? It's like there's a it connects to your primal side, yep. It's like a little reminder that, hey, you know the civilized world you live in? Like, that's not where you're from. <laughs> you're from the wild. Yeah. You're from the dirt, the mud. You know what I mean? Where I'm from. Oh, man. I think if we tapped into that a little bit more, we might be okay. Yeah. It'll help balance things. I think we've gone too far away from our primal selves. Mm -hmm. We've gotten to this, like, cushy, nerfed. Yeah. Little like made up society with these like fake rules that have like skewed and like baked our minds into yeah. this like unrealistic thing that is whatever uh, it appears, at least on social media, this world that people are living in. Yeah. But to your point earlier, that's not that's not even the real world. No. For the vast majority of people no. got to remind yourself of that. So yeah. I don't know. I think I'm out. Uh, I'm trying to think. This boy's been up for a minute. He's running on no sleep. <laughs> been up for 24 <laughs> hours now, I think. Uh, no, I'll sleep good. Okay. It's really not even that late, probably, right? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't looked at I turn my phone off. I go yeah. airplane mode. It's 10.58. Oh, that's not even that late. It's not that late. It's 10.58. Uh, no. But uh, thanks for being on the show, dude. Thanks I wish you all the on. luck with everything in the future. Hopefully the quarantine kind of gets all wrapped up and you get mm -hmm. back to killing it on Raw. Yep. Doing your thing. You know, I'm a big fan. I'll be supporting. If there's anything I can do, I'm here to help you. And uh, you know, maybe the outliers will uh, exist again. I'll tell you what. I still put that shirt on every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> we got our merch, man. <laughs> And mine's still in the bag in the closet. I sent you this the picture, right? I got we got our uh, the I, the what do you call it? Um, the merch, you know, the merch check for I can't think of what it's called. Well, what? How much was your merch check? Well, it's, I mean, it was I, whatever you know, tiny percentage, but there was like eighty-seven bucks. <laughs> So I think there was four <laughs> shirts bought. And I know my mom and dad were at least two of them. Oh, okay. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, mom and dad. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Ra uh, or Rawless. Yeah. <laughs> Moss. <sir. laughs> Mrs. Moss. Oh, all right, bro. Let's get up out of here. All right. I appreciate you, Big Dan. Peace. Oh, yeah, bro. Oh, <laughs> dude, I can't believe I forgot. One last time. <laughs> nah, One last time. We'll see. For now. For now.